my sentence Cause I knew it wasn't right The walls and the fences Came closer every night Only the light through the keyhole Kept me open and alive Just me, myself and I On a mission to survive I got it
Countdown to Green. We recap all the thrills and spills from The Clash. We take a look behind the scenes of the NASCAR Media Day. We take a look at how you're racing at home with the Logitech Show Us Your Ring segment. All that and more tonight on Countdown to Green. Hello. Hello and welcome to the E-NASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. This is Countdown to Green. I'm your host, Camille salazar Hadaway. Joining me, as always, we have Blake McCandless and Alan Cavada. How are you two doing? Oh, I'm so glad we're starting this season off. Uh, you see a different background behind me? That's because I'm already down in Daytona. This is Daytona 500 week, but it's also the kickoff, of course, for our series tonight so i can't wait to get this started new faces new places and a new people going after that championship blake uh, i've been waiting for this for a long time alan ever since we were done in september this is a new opportunity for a new dream for one of these 40 drivers to be realized and it all starts tonight and who knows who can propel a good run at daytona tonight to perhaps winning a hundred thousand dollars at the end of the year Oh, $100,000 sounds really sweet to these drivers. Maybe putting on a little bit of pressure as we get into the real season ahead. But before we get into what to expect for the season, we got to look back at how last season ended. Well, good evening, race fans, and welcome to the championship four finale of the 2023 E-NASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. Drivers, start your Let's go racing at Homestead. There is the battle for third in the championship. Garrett Lowe now catching up to Nick Ottinger. The 15 car, Blake, maybe finally getting that forward movement. Nick Ottinger has dropped five spots since he peaked in T17. He's peaked in at some point, you have to be on the aggressive side. The NASCAR iRacing World Champion and $100,000 to boot as all those tensions get a purple roll. Celebrating to Stephen Wilson, guys, is an e NASCAR champion. Oh, it's bringing on the memories. I loved being at the Hall of Fame. You know, it's always a good time when we have the finale there, especially when it's crowded with so much energy and good vibes. What was your favorite moment? Alan, let's start with you from the Hall of Fame finale. Oh, yeah, it's so hard to overlook Stephen Wilson getting the hugs from his family, of course. But who else was there that night? Remember, Kevin Harvick joined us on uh, at the table for some of the pre-races. Of course, they were the master ceremonies, kicking everything off. To have him there, and remember he, what he told us about the involvement, how important sim racing was to the real world and what it means to his team, to other drivers. To see him there, the future Hall of Famer at the NASCAR Hall of Fame, being there for our championship race, it meant a lot. So that was so memorable for me, Blake, to have not only Kevin Harvick, but there were a bunch of other NASCAR drivers, Xfinity, Cup, Truck there as well. That's such a cool time to integrate everything, especially for our championship. Well, and I think it wasn't just, you mentioned the family support that Steven Wilson had. And by the way, great family support that they flew out from the state of Iowa to come out there with him to be able to hopefully celebrate a championship. And luckily they were able to do that. But we were very fortunate to have a lot of drivers who were local to the Charlotte area. Nick Ottinger, Tucker Mentor, and Garrett Lowe. There was a lot of support there. Garrett Lowe had a bunch of students come out from uh, his engineering studies at the University of Charlotte that were there. Tucker Mentor, Nick Ottinger had a lot of families so uh, to see the support and how much it means to these families to see, you know, someone that they have supported in this endeavor for a long time to be able to chase that dream uh, was really special indeed. Of course, and on top of everybody else that was there, it was a very special night and can't wait to do it again. It is really nice to have all the drivers really come together in person because they're, they're actually really supportive of each other, um, especially in the most stressful times. <laughs> but also, when we have media day for eNASCAR, you see all the cool videos that come on throughout the broadcast of the race as well as Camp Down to Green. Our production team works really hard on that. And that that all happens on media day. So we're going to give you a behind the scenes look and see if we have some laughs to make it fun as well. What starts a rivalry in the e NASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing series? People that 
crash each other or like, or they're like butt heads on an issue or like a statement. Talk to you on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> If it's Daytona, I'd push you. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Can't say the whole field would, but no. I appreciate that. I'd push I, him, too. I don't, I don't know, man. I mean, you were up front last year, right? Yeah, the top five. All right, okay, all right. That's good enough for me. Yeah. I can rock some kicks. You know, I can even rock the hat when I let my ponytail down, so we're good to go on that. I'll trade you a pair of shoes for a nice hat. Nice hat? You want some extra hair, too, with that? I need some. <laughs> Oh, um, it's it's Nashville. I really want that one, Kwame, man. Yeah. I hate to break it to you, but I'd probably do the same thing to be honest. You know, I mean, Nashville. You want Nashville that bad? Oh yeah, it's my hometown track. I gotta okay. get that one. Okay. I'll, I'll have to pull a Jimmy Mullis move. Quack. Quack. If, you know? uh, if it was Dover, for me, it's, for me, it's Dover. So if if, if it won two at Dover, you know, I'm, I'm too. He, okay. he's, he might be right. the bumper. I've done it before. Green flag. Eight o'clock. Eastern? Is it really? Yeah. It's gonna be rough. What do you think about that? Actually, I kind of like no, it. I have class gets out at 515, so oh, okay. I, gotta, He's got I gotta book it home. He's got worse than I do. <laughs> I'm just sitting there waiting for the freaking race to start, so I'm not too worried about it. Would you wreck your mom to win a championship? Yeah. Like, no question. Yeah. Yeah. A little nudge, maybe. <laughs> Raven, did you like Barbie or Oppenheimer better? Barbie. You know what's crazy? I haven't seen either one. I've seen both in one day. I didn't we do went the, on a movie. Barbie, you, you bar yeah. Barbie Heimer. Yep, I Barbie Heimered. Let's uh, we you could. Guys have the same car, in a real world track. Who's winning? Same real car world. in a real world track. Are we yeah, driving we, a Pinto? We, we if it's a, a go kart, I don't think I'm gonna oh, be yeah. competing. <laughs> we're doing a go kart, and Keegan is not winning that one. He is um, forgetting how to lift. <laughs> that is what's gonna happen. So <laughs> the back. Is it, is it his fault or is it the car's fault? Jury's still out on that one. I don't know. You still okay after that? I'm still okay, yes. So. There's a backstory behind that. Yeah, there is. The, the backstory <laughs> there is that last time we were here, not not last time. Yeah. The, the, the backstory here is that in 2020, uh, for our iRacing Media Day, we all went to GoPro after the event, and uh, I didn't lift, or I didn't break, or maybe the cart didn't break. Um, I'm not going to point any fingers, but I hit the wall head on at 45 miles an hour. Uh, so, oh. yeah, that was that was a fun evening. <laughs> he had a rough evening. Using ah, oh my gosh. Um, we got to talk to production. How, do, how does that happen? Mm -hmm. Also, trying to blame it on the car? I don't know. Keegan. <laughs> That's what racers do. I mean, they, they got to blame the equipment, right? I'm just glad Keegan was able to bounce back and become a champion after that taking that hit. <laughs> That's tough, and to see all he's gone on to do. Uh, I would wonder, though, in a real next-gen car, I mean, he sim test for 2311, so I, I think I'd give Keegan a fair shot there, but good, glad he was able to overcome that Cardi accident. Jeez. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Going by cart is not a way to do it. Um, all right. <laughs> now, uh, if you pay attention to our social medias, which I know, uh, Blake, you do, there's been a little updates on the iRacing side. There has, and I think this is something a lot of users are going to be really interested in. So just b beneath my face right there, there's a QR code at the bottom right-hand part of your screen where you can see the full blog entry and update that includes all information that we're going to talk about here. But just a couple of quick pointers, the release of Millbridge Speedway is going to be a part of this right around the corner in February 2024 with this update. That's something that I know a lot of people have been waiting for for a very long time. So Millbridge going to be a part of this newest release. This is what I'm most excited for. You can see the radar on the left hand side. You can see the IMSA cars that are being used, which in the screenshot. So shout out to Drew Adamson because I'm sure he really loves that. But rain is finally coming to iRacing. I know there's been a lot of teasing about it. I, I cannot wait. I'm so excited to see what rain does and how it changes racing and all the work that has been going on by the engineers at iRacing for a number of years. I remember five years ago hearing rumors about them working on rain. So this has taken a long time, a great endeavor, but they want to get it right. But again, you can scan the QR code on the right-hand side of your screen. There's a blog post that details everything that is coming. It goes into pretty good detail and way above my pay grade. So go there, read it, some great information. 
there's lots of great information there as well. I love how you just said way above my pay grade. Um, well, we have <laughs> the team behind iRacing just really put it in the work there. So uh, thank you for those updates. Be sure to check that out. But for now, last show, we actually celebrated the return of the series with our Clash Race. And we got to find out or refresh you on how it all went down if you missed it. And of course, last week, uh, or two weeks ago, I guess I should say, we had a little bit of a different format or so rolling out. This is for fun. This is to give these guys a couple of uh, reps before we get started for the real deal here at Daytona. We had a couple of heat races that did not have some yellows. You could see early on in Heat 1, Alan, that was, uh, that was an interesting decision because it broke up this pack really early. That was so early on. And then we see teammates there trying to wreck each other, I guess, for the win. It's just a heat race. It's not even the actual clash itself. And then the action continued all the way to the end. This is the end of heat race one right there. I mean, just such good action. Then we had a whole other heat race. This was supposed to be for practice. Like, the aggression was full with no cautions and nothing on the line. It was practice, but with no consequences after Parker White takes down the win in heat race number one. It was a little more orderly here in heat race number two until somebody tried to make a three wide move, Colin Bowden, and he wrecks the car, or at least the team car that he used to be driving one year ago. Another move here with some lap traffic, but at the end of the day, uh, this one was a little bit cleaner, a little bit better, but Wyatt Tinsley is the one who takes down heat race win number two as we Look forward to the feature race. We got all of that out of the way. We set the grid for this feature. And uh, Alan, I would say that the heat races were a little more crazy, but I mean, the, the feature pretty much lived up to what the heats gave us. Sure, this is exactly what we want out of a preseason feature. I would think some drivers want to get a little practice for the big race tonight, also at Daytona, of course. But look at this, three wide. We got a really good look at the race and the new cars. Remember, this was the debut, if you will, of the new Camry, of the new Ford. We saw some beating and banging. We saw the, the consequence-free wrecking right here. But again, a good preview of what hopefully we will see tonight in terms of the racing. A lot of aggression here, a lot of drivers spinning out more than once on that clash night. But Hey, consequence-free. Again, uh, you, you got to learn a lot, I think, going into this race here tonight. Another huge accident happening just <laughs> past the tri-oval uh, before we settle it here with Wyatt Tinsley, who, just remember, we just talked about him winning heat race number two. He's up at the front. You typically don't want to be the leader coming down to the line, at least that we've seen in recent series history, but he's able to throw some perfect blocks and be able to get the job done. Uh, but I think overall, Alan, the one thing that this race kind of did, it got all the cobwebs out, all these drivers who have had a little bit of time to rest during the offseason and kind of be out of that competitive mindset. They're, they're able to get the cobwebs out, but now it's all about getting down to business. Everybody was having a good time. They'd spin. We talked to some drivers in second and third that were laughing and having a good time. That's not usually the way it goes. Everybody wants to do what Parker White's trying to do right here and win this race. So I think this is all I take from the clash is that now it's time to get down to business. It really is, and I just like that we got to see a whole new, uh, a whole new talent uh, level of talent out there in terms of the new drivers that have joined the series. Remember, a lot of free agency moves we'll cover later, but we got to see some of these teams, some of these drivers in their new cars, some of the rookies who have joined and come up to the series. I'll never forget Tucker Minter last year being able to win so early and then going on to be one of the championship four. Which one of these new drivers will be able to do that this year? We got an early look at them in this clash race, so they. They got to get the aggression out, get a little practice in with the Clash. It really means everything starting tonight. That's what I like about the Clash. Yes, there is no time for nerves. All of that has to go away because like Blake said, we are getting down to business. But the first thing is first is, well, we got to know where these races are taking place. So let's take a closer look. Welcome to the 2024 E-NASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. In our 15th season of competition, more than ever, drivers will be put to the test, facing new challenges, returning foes, and 18 races spread across the full spectrum of oval racing and beyond. Let's take a look ahead at the coming year for 40 of the world's best sim racers. February 13th kicks off the year at the iconic Daytona International Speedway for the first race of the 2024 season. 
For round two, it's time to break out the casino puns as the series heads to the Las Vegas Motor Speedway and rolls the dice on February 27th. Things heat up for round three as on March 12th, we head to the high banks and the wild pack racing at Hot Atlanta, Atlanta Motor Speedway. For round four, we wrap up segment one at the first short track of the year in the Old Dominion State at Richmond Raceway on March 26th. Segment two starts off with our second international venture for the Coke Series, as on April 9th, we go across the pond to the Brands Hatch Circuit in the UK, our first of two road course races this year. Back home in the US, round six takes us up to Delaware and to the Monster Mile at Dover Motor Speedway on April 23rd. The track returns on May 7th as we go five wide at the venerable Talladega Super Speedway in Alabama for round seven. On May 21st, round eight of the season sees us return to NASCAR's backyard at the Charlotte Motor Speedway for the longest race of the year at America's home for racing. Segment two wraps up with throwback time once again. Hosting us on May 28th is the Lady in Black Darlington Raceway for round nine. We embark on segment three with a return to a venue for the first time since the All-Star Exhibition Race in 2019, as round 10 takes us to the Midwest in the cornfields of Iowa at Iowa Speedway on June 11th. June 25th takes us back to the home of country music as round 11 takes us to our final intermediate before the start of the playoffs, Nashville Super Speedway. Round 12 takes us back to the track iRacing helped build in Sweet Home Chicago with the Chicago Street Course on July 2nd. Our returning venue to the Coke Series July 16th takes us back to the crossroads of America and the iconic oval of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for round 13. Leaving the Midwest in our final race before the playoffs, Pocono Raceway, home of some of the wildest finishes in E-NASCAR history, returns on July 30th. The 2024 E-NASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series playoffs kick off once again at the two-miler at Michigan International Speedway on August 13th. Race two of the playoffs takes us deep in the heart of Texas at Texas Motor Speedway on August 27th. The final race to lock yourself into the championship four will take place in the desert of Arizona at the Phoenix Raceway on September 10th. The championship race of the 2024 season sees us return to the Homestead Miami Speedway on October 1st, where the final four playoff drivers will battle for the title live and in person at the NASCAR Hall of Fame at Charlotte. All right. Oh, I just love those throwbacks. And here you can see the full schedule on your screen. Looking at this, Blake, which race are you most looking forward to? Well, we talked about it at the Clash a couple of weeks ago, and I'm still just as excited then as I am now about visiting Iowa Speedway. Kicking off segment three, I think this is a fantastic track. Multi-groove racing is the name of the game here at Iowa. It's got a lot of characteristic, a lot of bumps, especially as somebody who loves to run this track on the service. I'm glad that it's finally making its way over to the E-NASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series after joining the Cup Series schedule this year. It's not the first time this series has visited this track, put on a great race then I think it'll put on a great race again, Alan. Yeah, and I'm starting with tonight. Tonight's race at Daytona. Look, we all know Daytona is the biggest race of the NASCAR season. I think it could be the biggest race here tonight in the Coke Series. Who doesn't love pack racing, whether it's on NASCAR Sundays or here in the Coke Series? There's just so much on the line if you get that victory tonight. Think about, again, what we saw last year with Tucker Minter getting that victory in the first race of the year and taking that all the way to the championship four. So much on the line. We know it is a certain skill set it takes to win these races a lot of action. We saw what Wyatt Tinsley did in the clash, winning a heat race and then winning the whole thing. Can someone raise their game and lock their spot in the playoff tonight? That's what's on the line. Yes, we're all going to be definitely watching closely with this race, but I have to say Darlington is always my favorite. I love them sweet throwbacks. It's just always a good atmosphere. <laughs> now, now that we know uh, where that the season is going to be taking us, it's only right to learn more about the teams and their drivers. So let's take a closer look at that.
ladies and gentlemen, your 2024 eMASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series teams and drivers. Returning the season to the eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series is 2311. The Michael Jordan and Danny Hamlin outfit looks to bounce back in 2024 with the same duo returning from last season. Driving the number 23 from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, it's the 2021 champion, Keegan Leahy. And driving the number 45 from Brownsburg, Indiana, Michael Guest. From the hills of Germany, a mainstay of the road racing esports world, BS Competition Esports hits the NASCAR racing world for the first time in 2024. They look to make a splash this year, grabbing two of the 2023 playoff contenders. Driving the number 89 from Gastonia, North Carolina, it's Garrett Lowe. And from Bayonne, New Jersey, driving the number 90, it's Jordy Lopez. Back again for 2024, Parker Kligerman and Landon Castle's eRacer team look to turn their luck around in the Coke Series. Refreshing their lineup and hoping to put the purple out front once again with a series young gun and a former champion. Driving the number 42 from Royal Palm Beach, Florida, it's Tyler Gary. And driving the number 69 residing in Cape Coral, Florida, it's the four-time champion, Ray Alfala. It's the sophomore season for Joe Graff Jr. and FTR Excel E-Racing, as they hope to build on their success and break into victory lane in 2024 by bringing in a series rookie to join their team along with a returning name. Driving the number 12 from Poetin, Virginia, it's Garrett Maines. And driving the number 14 from Scohegan, Maine, it's rookie Seth Demerchant. It's also year two for the NASCAR team Front Row Motorsports. With Alan Bowes retiring after 2023, they look to boost themselves up in the team standings with a new driver alongside a returning favorite. Driving the number 34 from Mont Magny, Quebec, Canada, it's Derek Bundo. And driving the number 38 from Hagerstown, Maryland, it's Michael Cozy Jr. A mainstay of the E-NASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series since 2019, NASCAR team Joe Gibbs Racing returns once again to the series and will continue to develop their driver pairing as both return for 2024. Driving the number 18 from Fresno, California, it's Bobby Zelensky. And driving the number 54 from Jonesport, Maine, it's Daniel Falkingham. One of the most popular names in NASCAR, Junior Motorsports returns for 2024. After the retirement of main driver Michael Conti in 2023, Dale Jr.'s outfit will bring two familiar names into the iconic 8 and 88 this year. Driving the number eight from Aledo, Texas, it's Caden Honeycutt. And driving the number 88 from Manchester, Tennessee, it's Briar LaPrade. From the Midwest comes year two for the Kansas City Pioneers. KCP has already made a splash by winning the Clash at Daytona, and they hope to keep their momentum going into the 2024 season. Driving the number 20 from Hampton, Virginia, it's Wyatt Tinsley. And driving the number 48 from Houston, Texas, it's Graham Bolin. With a return to the real racing world just announced, Kevin Harvick Incorporated also makes their virtual racing debut this year, bringing in two familiar faces to put the NASCAR veterans team on the map in 2024. Driving the number 29 from Midland, North Carolina, it's Jimmy Mullis. And driving the number 62 from Darien, Illinois, it's Matt Busa. It's year five for NBC Sports and iRacing analyst Steve Letarte. Letarte Esports hopes to build on their consistency with another solid year, bringing in a new face to join a returning driver for 2024. Driving the number 36 from the Bronx, New York, it's rookie Kwame Scott. And driving the number 40 from Sacramento, California, Dylan Alt. From the worlds of Valorant, Siege, Rocket League, and Counter-Strike, m any look to reload and tear up the sim racing sphere in 2024, bringing in two former champions to leverage their run at this year's trophy. Driving the number 10 from Iowa City, Iowa, it's your defending series champion, Steven Wilson. And driving the number 80 from Cypress, Texas, it's your 2017 champion, Ryan Luza. Travis Pastrana is no stranger to taking things to the extreme, and his Nitro Circus Sim Racing team looks to make their mark on pavement racing in 2024, with both a series veteran and a true rookie to the series. Driving the number 41 from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, it's Dylan Duval. And driving the number 99 from Monroe, Michigan, rookie Matthew Zwack. 
Home of Boston Esports for both the Call of Duty League and the Overwatch League, Oxygen Esports puts their foot into the world of virtual racing for the first time, bringing along a former champion and a series veteran into their ranks for 2024. Driving the number five from Clinton, Connecticut, 2019 champion Zach Novak. And driving the number 22 from Revere, Massachusetts, it's Femi Olatenboson. In their sophomore year in the series, the Pittsburgh Knights look to joust their way to the front, bringing a new driver to support their roster in hopes to bring the Dale Earnhardt Jr. Cup to the City of Champions. Driving the number 27 from Myerstown, Pennsylvania, it's Cody Bias. And driving the number 55 from Framingham, Massachusetts, it's Ryan Doucette. Roush, Fenway, and Tezolowski RFK Racing look to make a splash in the offseason, securing a big name to join the team as the NASCAR frontrunner. Looks for their first Coke Series championship since 2019. Driving the number six from Conway, South Carolina, it's Timmy Holmes. And driving the number 17 from Suffolk, Virginia, it's Colin Bowden. Our final new team of the series, NASCAR Team Spire Motorsports enters the fray in 2024 hoping to put their racing knowledge on display and bringing two of the most popular Coke Series drivers onto the payroll in 2024. Driving the number seven from Greer, South Carolina, it's Malik Ray. And driving the number 77 from Matthews, North Carolina, the 2022 champion, Casey Kerwin. Austin Dillon's outfit, Team Dillon Esports, said goodbye to their drivers in 2023 and comes into 2024 with a brand new and familiar lineup bringing back a former driver along with a true rookie to defend their 2023 team championship. Driving the number three from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, it's rookie Jonathan Delaney. And driving the number 33 from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, it's Taylor Hurst. Back for a second stint in the series, Tony Kanaan Esports looks to make big moves in 2024, refreshing their driver lineup with two new acquisitions in hopes of bringing the Indy 500 champ his first victory in the series. Driving the number 11 from Temecula, California, it's Vicente Salas. And driving the number 66 from Frostburg, Maryland, Colin Keister. NASCAR star William Byron cut his skills in iRacing before he took to the real world. And he hopes he can bring home another Coke Series championship in 2024, bringing on board a new face to join a continuing champion presence on his team. Driving the number 25 from Claremont, North Carolina, 2020 champion Nick Ottinger. And driving the number 97 from Warrington, Virginia, it's Tucker Minter. When it comes to a name synonymous with motorsport, Williams has to top the chart. That prestige transfers over to the sim racing world, and Williams Esports returns to the Coke Series in 2024 with a new face to join their lineup. Driving the number 51 from Marietta, Georgia, it's Donovan Strauss. And driving the number 53 from Norwich Maine, it's Parker White. 20 teams. 40 drivers. This is your field for the 2024 eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. And plenty of new organizations are going to join that field of 20 teams. These are the six new ones to the grid here in the 2024 eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. Of course, KHI making their real world return. They're also going to hit the sim racing track as well, along with BS. Plus competition, Oxygen Esports, Nitro Circus, Spire Motorsports, and M80. Going to be joining the grid with us here in 2024. A lot of new drivers, new places, new faces, but it's Daytona and they're ready to get after it. Yes, you are right. And a lot of new movement as well with free agency happening um, in the off season. And I, with that, I have to ask, what is your favorite free agency move? For me, it has to be I'm watching those new teams and how they're just picking up some winners. Novak to Oxygen. You've got to keep a close eye on what these new teams are uh, planning and scheming up here. So I'm excited for that, Blake. Or Alan, actually, why don't you go ahead? Well, I was thinking about Tucker Minter. Look, Tucker Minter last year was one of the bright spots of the season. And now he goes over to William Byron Esports to team with Nick Ottinger. Both of those drivers were in the championship for last season. Now they're on the same team, William Byron Esports, just going to get even better. They are automatically, guys, the favorites for the team championship at the end of the year. I'm putting it in there. I told William Byron earlier this year, the 24 car and 24 for his championship. William Byron Esports, the lead favorite for the championship this year in the Coke Series, Blake. 
The one move that stuck out to me, if you're watching the championship broadcast last year, this shouldn't come as much of a surprise. It's Matt boosts uh, to Kevin Harvick Incorporated. Kevin uh, gave Matt a lot of praise during that broadcast about how much he has helped his own son, Keelan, in developing as the driver and using sim racing as a tool for that. So no shock, but uh, good to see with KHI coming to the field that they decided to bring along a very trusted name for that organization in Matt Busa. Well, Blake, you mentioned earlier, there's new places, new teams, and new faces. So it's only right that we catch up with one of the new faces, rookie Kwame Scott. My 2024 season goal really is to just, you know, try to settle in, you know, not try not to make any, any enemies, you know, I don't want any, you know, beef with any drivers too early on. But if I could just finish top 20, I was, you know, really just to get my foot in and I actually have to do, do a contender the following year. Um, that would be, that would be ideal. You know, just want to settle in, really. It's a very aggressive series from uh, everything. I mean, just racing through a contender and watching the Coke series on, you know, on iRacing. Uh, just trying to keep the nose clean, really, and not, yeah, try to try to get some good finishes, just, you know, consistent finishes. Um, especially with the format that we have in some of these races, I think they're gonna get a little bit feisty. Daytona is everything. I mean, winning Daytona would mean a lot. Growing up, you know, Daytona is just like such, so magical in everyone's, you know, world. And, uh, you know, actually being able to go to Daytona last year, kind of experiencing just like, the whole vibe of Daytona, you know, and being like, and actually having it be like kind of familiar is is really cool. That was my first time there, but yeah, it, it's uh, that'd be pretty sweet if I got to if I got to win there. My biggest challenger, probably my teammate Dylan Alt, to be honest. Um, you know, I've already learned so much from him through racing and contender, and you know, he's also now my Nexus esports teammate, and also my Latari. Uh, esports teammate as well. So we're actually, you know, core teammates. Um, so it's nice having Dylan by my side. He's, he's going to be, yeah, he's going to be a, a great help and he's super competitive. Uh, you know, he's, I would say Dylan, Dylan Hart for sure. My, my favorite eNASCAR moment, probably qualifying fourth at Texas in the last race in contender. Um, that was like my best qualifying out of like the entire season. And qualifying fourth in that field really, really meant a lot to me, you know, proved to me that like I deserve to be here and that now I'm more than capable of racing with these guys. Love to see rookies bring in that energy, that that real hunger to win the series. Right, Al? Yeah, yeah it, was, it was great. And I met him at Media Day and we saw in the video, but he is so tall. So it was just jarring <laughs> to see him in person, but to have him join the series and see how excited he is and know how valuable it is to be a part of the series. And he knows his goal already. I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back to the Contender Series. That's motivation, Blake. Well, again, there's a lot of drivers who are part of the series now that they've been trying to get to this series for a number of years. It's not a one, two, or three-year process, and sometimes it could take a little bit. Kwame being one of those drivers, he's finally here. He wants to make a statement and obviously have some staying power in this series for a while. Now, uh, speaking of, you know, it takes some time, the series has been here for quite some time, and 2024 is bringing new changes as well to the rules. Blake, take us through what that looks like. Yeah, we're going to have a couple of format changes going into 2024, one of which being bonus points and segment points. Now, playoff points, typically wins pay three playoff points coming into this season. That has been changed to now wins offer five playoff points to start the opening round of the playoffs for every individual win should you be playoff eligible when all is said and done at the end of the regular season. Now, there's also going to be a new introduction here of points called set. Segments. Now, this isn't going to affect the season-long regular season points, but for each segment, for each group of five races, 
that each segment takes a part of. There will be three in the regular season. At the end of that segment, the leader of the segment points will get five additional playoff points as well as a little bit of money on top of that. $3,000. So a little bit more for these drivers to try and fight for here in 2024. More playoff points on the line. We know how important winning already is. And now you have these segment points to fight. So even if you have a bag segment one or whatever, you can go to segment two and you can still try to fight for it. So season long, these guys have all the incentive in the world, Alan, to keep fighting. Yeah, and the path to that checkered flag is going to change a little bit at the short tracks and um, the road courses. The format is changing for the short tracks. They're going to use the heat formats, kind of like what we saw in the clash where there'll be two heat races that will set the lineup for the big main event, similar to the dual races, if you're a NASCAR fan this week at the Daytona 500. At the road courses, they're gonna use short sprint races that will help set the feature lineup for that. And But also, a, a twist here, Blake, is that the top eight from qualifying in those sprint races will be inverted. So, anybody that's really with something of a road course expert say maybe a little disadvantage or maybe a little more of a challenge if you want to get that good starting spot for the big race on those road courses but some format changes some points changes that should really turn things around this year in the coke series guys yeah it's gonna definitely shake some things up um but you know what why don't we actually catch some of the viewers up on some headlines they might have missed and that they need to pay attention to heading into the series alan why don't you kick things off well, oh, my biggest uh, sorry, my biggest headline going into this year is that Kevin Harvick is joining the series. Kevin Harvick Incorporated bringing his team, his name to the Coke Series has two great drivers going for the championship now, and just bringing his name, his sponsors. If you remember last year at the Hall of Fame, Kevin Harvick was there talking about how important sim racing is to Sunday success of these top NASCAR teams. So again, to have that connection from the real world to the sim racing here in the Coke series. It really just reinforces how important that relationship is. Kevin Harvick, future Hall of Famer here in the Coke series, KHI, two important drivers with all those sponsors. That's my biggest headline of the offseason, Blake. Well, and I think, I mean, this one's pretty easy to me. I don't think there's any bigger storyline heading into 2024 is the fact that we have the GOAT, who is it, Logan Helton. <laughs> Ray Alfala is back, four-time, is back in the series. He had a one-year venture out of it. He was able to fight through immediately and find his way back to the top. I think he's got some new motivation and is ready to prove that he has some staying power. He belongs, and he may try to get an unprecedented fifth championship there you could see him with the dale earnhardt jr cup he wants it and well we were able to catch up with ray get a couple of his thoughts on being back in the coke series in 2024. well racing is is my passion you know i've been doing it since i was a kid been watching it uh, racing online uh, you know everything i watch all sorts of racing i'm racing is basically my life so uh, you know, falling out of the series was a big blow, but it just means I had to I had to get back in it. You know, I'm I'm not I'm not done by any means. Uh, you know, I still feel like I'm still at the top of my game. You know, the cars have changed, the you know the series has changed, but I still feel like I'm still, you know, who I used to be. I just have to do a better job of adjusting to everything. It was tough. I was at a very low point at the end of 22. Um, just realizing that I wasn't going to be in the series uh, the following year, um, you know. But I knew I wasn't. I wasn't done. You know, I still wanted to compete. I still wanted to be a part of it. So, you know, I got went all the way down to the truck series and raced. Uh, you know, the whole road to pro ladder, and it was hard. Uh, I only got one win the entire year, but you know, I was basically able to finish where I needed to finish and get back in the series. But it was it was difficult being outside of it. And basically, you know, I still follow the series. I was basically a fan on the sidelines and uh, you know just wishing I could I could be there you know I like being in the top series uh, just a competitive drive you know uh, being one of the top 40 sim racers and you know been doing it for over 20 years now and on you know in the in the sim for 15 years in the coke series so just to drive to win my biggest competition has got to be the most recent champion, especially the last two champions, because it is the next gen car, Stephen Wilson and Casey Kerwin. Uh, you know, they have it figured out, and you know, they've been to the Charlotte Land event at the end of the year. 
which is a big goal of mine is getting there. That'd be really, really cool. When the series first started, my goal was to get up on the stage, you know, and win a championship someday. Um, so my, you know, a big goal of mine is just to make it to the championship four and be able to, to compete. So I think those two guys are probably, you know, the biggest challengers uh, just based on recent performance. My 2024 season goal is to win the championship. Number five would mean that I'm still, you know, still in it, still competitive. Uh, you know, I've had a drop in performance last few years. You know, the cars have changed a lot, series has changed a lot. Um, so I just want to prove to, to myself mostly that I can still do this at the top level and I can still race for a championship and, and, and win the championship. I just, I don't know, I've been through a lot of different cars, a lot of different people that I've raced over the years, uh, different eras, I feel like. It's crazy that it's been 15 years. It doesn't seem like that long. Um, but it's just nice to, it's nice to still be in it after missing last year and uh, looking forward to you know, getting back out there and chasing uh, championship number five. Well, I think he, you know, he said it all. He he had the lowest of lows. He's looking to get back to the highest of highs. And he was even quite honest in that segment, Camille, about the fact that he had a little bit of a dip in performance. But again, I think a little bit of a step back coming back into the series. That may be the solution for Ray Alfala to get back to his winning ways. Yeah, definitely go back and strategize and come back eagerly. Uh, speaking of making a comeback, one of my favorite <laughs> segments on Countdown to Green is back. This is Show Us Your Rigs brought to you by Logitech. This is where we get to see your rigs at home and be really jealous at how beautiful they look. Let's start off with our first one from Chris Rye. Yeah, I've been waiting for this all off season, Camille. Look, big monitor, love that. Big Mark Trix, junior fan, love the sheet metal, the old Goodyear tire. That is a great rig right there. Let's go on to our next one from Dan Hall. Whoa, there's a lot happening Ooh. here. Yeah, there is. I mean, you got the, the multiple camera views here, the tripod set up to try and look at everything. Man, this is really complex. Got all four screens going, but man, you can you can see a lot. This is a professionally done. You can see the play seat there, very professionally done. Great rig there for uh, for Dan. And our uh, next one is from Mel's. Yeah, another pretty one. This is a desk mount, old school Logitech. Doesn't matter what you have as long as you're in the game. I love this. And look at that. Sheldon Creed bumper ties it all together appropriately on the back of the rig. I really like that. That's creative. Yeah, I do like the bumper touch. Let's get to our next rig. Christopher Allen with this desk mount. Ooh. Ah, uh, this brings back some memories. This is uh, kind of the setup that I had in sim racing for a long time. Just the, the good old fashioned laptop. You know, sometimes you can get it done simply the old fashioned way. You can see the Logitech wheel. Great Jeff Gordon diecast that he has, cool. by the way, too. But yeah, this is uh, this is how a lot of people get started. You don't need the fanciest setup. It can just be simple. So Christopher Allen there, bring it back some memories there for me. Great, you don't, great rig yeah, right there. You if you want to call it that. The quality <laughs> high-end setup. But I mean, if you do, well, our friends at RFK Shop Rigs sent in this rig. Yeah, look at this. RFK really getting in the game here. I love it. High-end rigs. Remember, the teams use these at the shop. It's so important yeah. to reiterate how important that connection is between these big NASCAR teams, the sim racing world, the Coke series. A lot of them have you know, sim drivers on hand. This is so neat to see at RFK Racing. I hope the entire team is taking advantage of it over there because those are some beauties at the yeah. shop over at RFK. They're always just making us so jealous over here. We gotta <laughs> love it though. Make sure that you send us your rigs by tagging iRacing and eNASCAR because we love to see what you're up to. Now, uh, there's some throwbacks there. You were feeling a little nostalgic, Blake. Well, guess what? We're gonna bring another piece of nostalgia because we have a new segment called The Vault that is gonna look back at previous eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing series seasons because this is 14 years you know this is a long time for the series so we're going to start off tonight with a 2010 look uh, this one coming from iRacing staff writer and series historian Justin Malillo everything has its starting point and in 2010 that was Dean NASCAR's. The date was February 9th, 2010, and the winner on that day, NASCAR Hall of Famer, Dale Earnhardt Jr. 
Back then, making moves on plate tracks wasn't so easy, but Dale Jr. was able to get through the field from the 19th starting position. He utilized some pit strategy to get up front. Dale was leading the way as the caution flew with two laps to go, as he coasted across the line to claim that very first victory. From Dale's mouth himself, if that yellow didn't happen, he wouldn't have made it and would have probably finished around 20. Thomas Hazard finished second that day, and the 2010 champion Richard Towler finished 16th. And that's been a look back at one of the most memorable moments over the last 14 seasons of the eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. And by the way, shout out, it has been, uh, this is like the holy grail or uh, of trying to find replays of this race. So shout out to Tim Whitley here. It's a 10-year search to find the replay of this original Coke Series race. He came through clutch on Twitter. So thank you very much. And yeah, Dale Earnhardt Jr. goes to victory lane in the first ever eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series race, Alan. Yeah, I mean, look, Dale Jr. winning this race, having this footage way back in 2010 to have this available is just so cool. And now the championship trophy is named after him. No bigger advocate for iRacing than Dale Jr. way back, way back in the day. So to have this, this is just neat to see. This is part of his Hall of Fame career right here. Oh, yeah, I feel like we're... I feel like we're going to have just so many of these moments with the vault that series just or that segment looking back at the 14 years of eNASCAR. Of course, we're in our 15th season, so we have to celebrate all of that nostalgia uh, that's taking all of us back. But for now, uh, you know, like for some people that might have tuned in a little late to Countdown to Green. Remember, we start at seven. Uh, remind them of some updates that are coming for iRacing. All right, we'll do it again. Well, once again, we'll throw a QR code up on the screen. It's just right beneath my face right here. Uh, point your phone at it. You can scan it. You can get all the information about this next update that is coming. Of course, you could see on screen one of the uh, assets that is going to be in that update is Millbridge Speedway. I know that's something that especially people around the Charlotte Mooresville area, Alan, you'll know for a very long time, have Ooh. been waiting to see Millbridge Speedway finally added to the sim and in short order it will. This is what I am looking forward to the most though. Right after this, you can look and see the radar on the screen and how much this is going to change how iRacing is done. There have been years and years of development development and work going into this so of course hats off to all of the iRacing engineers and development team that have been working painstakingly on adding rain yes rain to iRacing and how much that is going to completely change the dynamic of how weather how sim racing is done going to be revolutionary I can't wait I'm ready to wheel an 87 car around Watkins <laughs> Glen or wherever in the rain it's going to be great and uh, I just can't wait to enjoy it yeah, well, uh, I, you know, I think it's time. We are less than 15 minutes away from the main show for the main race. Uh, we got to get into Daytona because it is such a pinnacle moment or, you know, really setting the tone for what the series means for each of the drivers. So let's check in with them to see what Daytona means to them. Winning Daytona would be a relief. Uh, to start the season ultimately with not having so much pressure building up throughout the year. Winning Daytona would mean, it'd mean I was in the playoffs, so I'd be very excited if I won Daytona because I could just cruise up until like the 16th race, I think. Winning Daytona would mean the world to my team. Daytona is everything. I mean, you know, when you think about NASCAR, at least for me, you know, when I think about uh, NASCAR, you can't, and the first thing that pops into your head is just, you know, it's, it's Daytona. Daytona is the biggest race of the year. Winning Daytona would mean that the comeback is complete. Daytona is scary. Daytona is chaotic. Daytona is a mess. Daytona is a racetrack. Daytona is a little bit more special, though. Winning Daytona would mean uh, a lot of alcohol, uh, a lot of yelling, a uh, huge celebration. Daytona is an opportunity. After winning at Daytona, my season radically changed. I couldn't really put into words what it was like last year, just the emotions of my first ever race in the series and then passing the reigning champion on the last lap. It was definitely just a, a crazy race. So being able to win there, just cement yourself and your legacy in the series as a Coke Series race winner, it's awesome.
Obviously lots of emotion there and a lot of passion from the drivers because Daytona does mean a lot. So with that, Alan, take us through the track analysis. Yeah, it's the track that we all love. Two and a half miles around this high bank, high speed, super speedway, of course, that we all know. They've been racing here since 1959. Big Bill France built those high banks. Two and a half miles around, 31 degrees of banking in the turns, even 18 in the tri-oval. That's how they get all this speed. And we saw him in the video, what it means to him, Tucker Minter. He won here last year as a rookie, vaulted him right to the playoffs, and we know what that meant for him. This year, a new feature. We're not just going to show you this map of the track. We're going to show you what it's like to go around the track live and in living color because our man Blake, who has, knows what it's like to go around this track, is going to show us a few laps here on his home rig because he is plenty of experience at this track. What's it like, Blake? This is live. This is awesome. Well, you know, we've still got a little bit of about half a pace lap or so to load in uh, before we get started here. But, you know, this is kind of when all those nerves kind of start to subside, build up. Drivers take it so many different ways, but this is when it gets real. I'm sure when these guys are heading off of pit road in the clash, they're just looking to go out and have a good time. But there's nothing quite about getting into a race where you know everybody in there is so good as all of these drivers are. And you know what? This is a little bit of a, we've been talking about nostalgia trips a lot tonight. This is, this kind of reminds me of when I was a little kid. This is kind of how I started sim racing, if you want to call it that. Five, six years old playing against the AI at Daytona because it's the only track I could drive without spinning out. This is a, <laughs> this is a nice little uh, nostalgic trip for me. Now, of course, if you are on iRacing, you can race against the AI whenever you want. You can load up the UI, different tracks, different cars. These NASCAR tracks have the AI ready to go, but the pace car is going to dive off, and I guess we'll just get ready to go here in a, in a second. Yeah, you're putting yourself shotgun on the field here, but give yourself a little challenge. I appreciate that because we know you can get out front and lead every lap, but Blake, what's this challenge oh, like from the back, feeling the draft, feeling just the, the pressure around you to get past some of these cars? The pressure of your colleagues here at Canton to Green judging your every <laughs> moment. <laughs> I, I will it, say the well, one thing that is going to get really difficult here, you're not going to see it so much on the back straightaway. And the one thing that really sticks out to me is how little you can see in front of you. And that's just part of racing Daytona in general. Can move out of line and kind of move up to this second lane here. But look, when I'm on the back, right on the back bumper of this 27 car, Cody Bias, I'm having to check up. I can't really see a whole lot of what's going in front of me. This is why almost every single driver in the field is going to need spotters. They're going to need that communication. And you're going to need a lot of help to go with you. I'd love to go up here on the top side. And you know what? Maybe we'll just try it here for the heck of it. But as soon as I dip out of line, I don't have any help. I don't have anybody behind me. So I'm not going to be able to make up a ton of ground. You're going to have to stick in line and wait for some runs to develop. Oh, look, I love our boy Dale Jr. He has raced Daytona and he has broadcast. He's never done both at the same time, Blake, just like you are right now. So kudos <laughs> to you, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. The man of unique talents, I suppose, as I fall to the back of the field. <laughs> Next time we got to have him race while he's actually doing the whole show. I think that's a good challenge. I love it. Yeah, challenge Blake this year. <laughs> and with that, uh, Daytona, you know, there's lots of trends that we see there. Alan, what are the top ones that we could pay attention to going into the Yeah, race? we we've been coming here a long time so there are certain trends that we have to look at when it comes to daytona this is the 17th coke series race at the daytona oval the series did race here twice in 2010 and 2020 so we've been here a lot five races have finished with four cautions here at daytona you would think it may be a little more sometimes but the average race is only three cautions here at daytona so that's pretty good for our pro series drivers here only two active winners qualified outside the top 20 and still won the race. Ray Alfali, you saw him there. He started 34th back in 2015, and then Nick Otger started 21st in 2018. Still came back to win it. Not bad at all. Only one driver, though, has ever won Daytona from the pole. Very interesting. Bobby Z, Bobby Zielinski, back in 2020, the second Daytona race, was able to take it nearly flag to flag. And then... Only two Daytona winners have gone on to win the championship. Of course, Ray Alfala there with the trophy and Zach Novak back in 2019. And we'll give you a little bonus, guys. Ray Alfala, we keep mentioning his name a lot, you know, the, the goat of this stuff. Ray Alfala is the only multi-time 
Daytona Oval winner. So there's a lot of winners in the field tonight. Can someone win again? Or will Ray Alfala win for yet another time? Hey, Blake, were you thirsty after all that work you were just doing? Yeah, yeah, you know, I got a little worked up or whatever. Had to, had to cool down a little bit. Yeah, we saw you at that zero sugar, just trying to get it in before we went back on camp. That's hilarious. Uh, but you know what? We got to talk about what this really comes down to for a camp down to green. Our picks. Because we need to find out who is going to win. Yes, this is where we uh, we choose our drivers for each race. We accumulate points based on how they finish and then crown a countdown to green winner right here. You know what, Alan? Although you won the last season, we're going to start with Blake because that's just no. what we do here in Countdown to Green. Uh -oh. Blake, who's your, who's your driver for tonight? The, the one takeaway that I had from the clash and kind of moving into a new mindset for picking this year is I like winners. So you know what? I'm going to go with somebody who answered the bell in the heat in the feature last week. I'm going to go with Wyatt Tinsley, my man. Second year, he's going to get his first Coke Series win and sweep, entirely sweep Daytona in 2024 Ooh. Speed Weeks. All right, Blake. Thanks for that. Uh, Alan, what are you saying? Well, I too like winners, especially being the winner of this challenge last year. But my winner I'm taking is last year's Daytona winner, Tucker Minter. I'm picking him to go back to back at Daytona and start his season off right once again. Remember this time with a new team, new teammate and Nick Ottinger. I think they start off real strong, but Tucker gets the checkered flag, Camille. All right, my question for you is who told you who my pick is? Because my pick is also Tucker Ooh. Minter. Um, and you know what? I think we started off this last season similarly where we were picking the same drivers and then we left Blake behind and then it was just between us. So maybe <laughs> this is just a telling for what's to come for this season as well. But what's I hope that? so. I see an illusion. That's all I see. What? <laughs> uh, no way. No way. But you know what? We have the driver, the race coming up uh, right after this. So be sure to stay tuned because right after these commercials because we have more in store for you. The race up ahead. Thank you so much for tuning in to Countdown, Countdown to Green. Uh, I'm just so excited, as you can tell. Let's head into it. Each year, NASCAR begins its season during Black History Month and recognizes the accomplishments of past and present icons within the sport. From Sam Bell Navis, one of the first black corporate executives, to Bubba Wallace, the first black driver to earn multiple wins within the NASCAR Cup Series. Milestones like these continue to drive our sports future, and we are proud to celebrate them all year long. Every time you sit behind the wheel, you buckle up for the unexpected. You get ready to take on the competition, embrace yourself for the chaos, the speed, the weather, the unknown. But above all, when strapping in, you put trust in yourself, your intuition. Make it your guide to win, your drive to win. He's a winner in this. And nothing is going to stop you from winning. When you want to be the best, you can't settle for the rest. For anything on iRacing, there's just one name you need, Mo Cody. We now provide the best of the best in setups, paint schemes, coaching, broadcasting, and event organization. With cars across all four license classes, we have what you need to hit the track with confidence. 
Grab a subscription and save money while going fast at MaconeySetupShop.com forward slash subscriptions. And remember, at Maconey Setup Shop, there are setups, but your victories. Is this the start of a dynasty? Ryan Blaney is an NASCAR Cup Series champion. A redemption tool. Ready to go to work. Is this the face of a ruthless competitor or a villain? I'd be your favorite driver. Is it time for a breakthrough? Let's go! To get back to breaking stuff? Hey, or is this the makings of the wildest ride you'll ever witness? It's all of the above, and it's about to go down. Any questions? $100,000 begins with Chapter 1. We're tonight from iRacing's virtual Daytona International Speedway. We say good evening, sim racing fans, and welcome to Race 1 of the 2024 eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. Well, as always, happy that you are with us in the iRacing broadcast booth. Alongside myself, Evan Pasoko, joined as always by Blake McCandless, as well, Ryan Vargas, a part of our broadcast team with you this year. And Blake, I'll go to you first on this one. With all the talk of new stages, bonuses, fix setups, heat, sprints, you name it. Tonight, it's pretty simple. It is a 80-lap race at Daytona, a ticket to the playoffs on the line, a familiar place for many of these drivers. Well, and I think the one thing that all that newness Springs is that we talk about the importance of being able to get a win and how much Daytona plays into that. This is a race, Ryan. I think that anybody has the opportunity to win and winning is now even more important than it was last year. So I think we'll see nothing different than all these drivers putting everything on the line to kick start their 2024 season. Yeah, I mean, you're not you're not wrong about that. Anybody has a shot to win tonight. You know, there's 40 of the greatest uh, sim racing drivers in this race here tonight. It's going to be an absolute brawl. But the biggest thing here tonight is who's going to be your friend. Who's going to want to push you to the win? Who's going to work with you throughout the race and keep you up front with that track position? It is going to be a fun one, and we're happy that you're strapped in virtually for the ride with us here in Daytona. There's $1,000 on the line as well tonight for the drivers who finish in the top three, but that's small picture. Again, big picture is $100,000 to our eventual series champion, more than 500 on the line from start to finish. It is the biggest prize purse this series has ever seen as we are set to drop the green flag on the 15th season of the eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing series and with that we go trackside and take a look at your coca-cola starting grid and it is nick ottinger a defending champ from a couple of years ago he is on pole in his william byron esports number 25 and he'll be joined on that front row by the latar esports number 36 machine of kwame scott back on row number two third spot tonight gonna go to the number 20 machine of wyatt tinsley and he'll be joined by the 40 of dylan alt that's another latar esports entry on the outside Side row on row number three it is michael cozy jr the front row motorsports number 38 car next to the kevin harvick incorporated number 29 of jimmy mullis back on row four it is the joe gibbs racing 54 car of daniel falkingham and jonathan delaney second highest starter of your rookies in the team delaney sports number three car he'll start in eighth and speaking of rookies how about three of them in the top nine true blood rookie for the fgr xl e-racy to 14 of seth the merchant he's p9 ahead of the junior motorsports 88 car brian lapratt who will start in 10th 
Some more experience back in row 11 with Ryan Doucette for the Pittsburgh Knights on the inside and Donovan Strauss for Williams Esports. Once again, returning to the series, he'll go from 12th position. 13th will be Tony Kanan's new driver in Colin Keister with Parker White. He won a heat last week for Williams Esports. He'll start directly behind his teammate in 14th. 15th goes to the 23-11 playoff competitor last season in Michael Guest with Garrett Lowe, Championship 4 finalist with a new outfit. BS Plus competition going from the 16th starting spot. 17th for Cody Bias and the other Pittsburgh Knights entry. 18th Nitro, or Nitro Circus, I should say, for Dylan Duvall starting in 18th. And rounding out the top 20, have Oxygen Esports with the four series champion Zach Novak and RFK back with Timmy Holmes in 20th. And with that, halfway home, back on row number 11, it is the second of the Austin Dillon-supported entries, the Team Dillon Esports number 33 of Taylor Hurst, and the second BS competition car, that's the 90 of Jordy Lopez. Back on row number 12, it is the second of Kevin Harvick Incorporated entry, that one, the 62 machine of Matt Boosen. The big names continue to P24, the Joe Gibbs Racing 18 of Bobby Zelensky. Then Malik Ray will find himself inside row 13 in the Spire Motorsports, number seven, one of the new teams to the series. And the GOAT is back. The four-time champ Ray Alfala pilots his Eraser 69 car off from the outside of row 13. Vicente Salas will take the Tony Kanaan Racing number 11 machine alongside the 23-11-23 of Keegan Leahy. Of course, that team headed up with the joint venture of Denny Hamlin and Michael Jordan. And then around that, your top 30. It is the 48 machine of Graham Bolin and the 77 car of Casey Cohen. Leading off the back quarter of the field will be Tyler Gary this year for E-Racer alongside Garrett Maines returning with FGR Excel in the 16th row. Row 17, you'll see Colin Bowden for RFK Racing are looking to make some moves along with the defending series champ with N80 in Steven Wilson. Starting in 35th tonight, Femi Olat back. He's with Oxygen Esports this season, along with Ryan Luza, who's been running some pro late model races at the World Series of Asphalt Stock Car Racing. He goes from 36th tonight in a different sim racing location for him. 37th is Derek Bordeaux for Front Row Motorsports. With William Byron Esports, is Tucker Mentor looking to get back to the championship four with his new team. Caden Honeycutt for Junior Motorsports has a long way to go from 39th, and Matthews Wag for Nitro Circus will round out this 40 car field. It's a look we top to bottom you. at your starting grid. Let's dial up your pole sitter, Nick Ottinger, career pole number 26. Blake's with him on the radio. Familiar spot for you to be, Nick, but you're in a great position here at Daytona. Does this pole help you out? And what's your mindset heading into this race? Uh, I mean, you know, we're looking forward to getting our season off strong. You know, we, we set out pole position, obviously. And, you know, our Logitech G team, you know, this is the best spot to be, obviously, leading the field to the green and start our season with our challenges that, you know, we want to check off and grow from. And, you know, we're in a good spot. And I'm excited to have Logitech G back with our William Byron Esports team for a fifth consecutive year and happy to be representing William Byron and Logitech G. So hopefully you guys enjoy the show. You saw a lot of chaos last or two weeks ago in the class. Do you anticipate that same sort of start here tonight? Uh, at a certain point, uh, you just get such huge runs that form kind of in the midst of nowhere, to be frank with you. So um, it's kind of a chess game out here. The problem is you're doing that basically 205 miles per hour, and it's just hard to kind of gauge where those runs form. So that's why a lot of a lot of folks like myself, you know, rely on your, your spotters to a heavy degree. And, you know, and yeah, we're excited for the challenge, man. I mean, it's, it's going to be a good 2024 season and want to be – wouldn't want to do this with any other group. All right, Nick, we'll let you get after it. Thanks for talking to us. Appreciate it, Blake. So that's your pole sitter tonight, Nick Ottinger. 26 poles for him, more than any other driver in series history. Now, Ryan, tonight's race, 80 laps, 200 miles. Walk us through it with a look at a NASCAR race analysis. Yep, to kick the shindog, shindig uh, off tonight, we got 80 laps of distance, 200 miles. Pit road speed is 55 miles per hour. Pit pit time is about 35 to 40 seconds, so you got to be efficient. you got to be quick on pit road. Three sets of tires available, and the estimated pit window is anywhere from 38 to 42 laps. So you got to keep out for those pit stops. 
And the key is, you got to be there after 80 laps if you want to be a part of this one. As always, we're happy you're spending your Tuesday night with us on the iRacing Esports Network. Pace car off and in. Field in the hands of Nick Ottinger. Let's go racing at Daytona. Good run on the outside as they get through the gears and head to the high banks for the first time. Advantage to the outside. Kwame Scott for a moment, but pretty clean throughout. No major issues. Some three wide in the midfield. Looks like a little bit of instigating going on. Top 10 or so might be the 41 car of Dylan Duvall trying to make it happen. But up front, though, two by two as now dropping down the middle, I think, is the 40 of Dylan Alt. I was wondering how quickly we were going to see drivers if, if they were just going to kind of stay two by two, play it safe here for the first couple of laps. And I think you can see why so many aren't. You saw all jump into the middle. He's free falling through the field. And Duval, he was able to make up a couple of rows for maybe two or three seconds and otherwise falling all the way to the back of the field. So a much different approach, Ryan, than what we saw at the beginning of the class just two weeks ago. Yeah, but we have a lot of familiarity at the front. We got Michael Cozy Jr. leaving that inside line with a big shot from Falkingham. Wyatt Tinsley, the cat, the, the clash winner, pushing your outside leader. It's going to be interesting watching going down the backstretch. And you can see all the movement down the backstretch. They may be running in a single file line, but nothing about this is orderly. You're just basing your, your car off the car in front of you and hoping that that car isn't going to hit the car in front of him. If the iRacing drone shot gives us a good perspective of how wide Daytona actually is, but I promise it doesn't feel that wide from you're behind the wheel. That middle lane doesn't feel like it's that six, seven feet that it actually is. A bit of a breakaway at the front, that three-way draft between Cozy, Falkenham, and Demergent pulled the big advantage. A couple of cars went high to low. They now go back up topside, and they will reel those top three back in. Blake, gone are the days of being able to get two, three cars drafted up together and running away from the field, but they had a bit of a jail break to get to those top spots and now the lead pack seems to be topside heavy as those lead spots about nine cars in favor to the high line well i was about to say they pretty much force everybody else to get organized so that they can catch them and you know that's something that we'll have to keep note of uh, throughout the rest of this race the fact that kind of three cars right there just completely broke away from the rest of the field now everybody gets a run they're able to catch back up to them uh, but that's something, uh, especially when we get late in this race, we talk about how aggressive the shoves have to be to be able to make speed. And you're going to want to form those two car tandems, those three car tandems we may see a little bit later on tonight. You're making those final pushes to the end. There's a look off in the back of Michael Cozy Jr. He continues to lead this race after having eyes. led the last two laps. Yeah, he's looking up, trying to keep an eye on what's going on behind him. He's more so looking out the mirror, I think, that he is out in front, holding the bottom. That outside lane again very quickly fell apart when the momentum came up on the inside. So his job as the lane leader is to work both lanes. He slides high on the exit of four, the 14 to machine, the 55. They both go with him. So they're going to try a little bit of lane management to stay with wherever the momentum is. Well, and it's interesting to see how much how much the tandem's really coming into play. I mean, Seth the Merchant, we know he's a good super speedway racer. He's lit up the ranks going all the way up to the Coke Series. As you see, Falkingham almost gets shoved three wide, but it's no surprise to see Cozy and Falkingham uh, working their way to the front. Uh, these guys are just constant, constant front runners at these super speedways. So I'm going to keep my eye on Cozy all race long. See a little bit of movement there. I think that was Falkenham, to your point. Fourth in line, top side. Get a little bit high on the entry. He's able to reel it back in. And that middle lane's going to be tempting. You can see you get back about 15th or so. They are three wide there, but it's challenging to get that to drive up the middle. They need the strength and numbers that the inside and the outside have, Blake. A great move here. Colin Keister, remember, he didn't start anywhere near the front of the field. He's had to very quickly work his way up and... You can see three wide starting to form just about everywhere now, or at least those drivers that are kind of further on back. 
trying to make those moves. So, uh, you know, that's kind of one thing coming into this race that I thought was going to be a little bit different from the Clash was how easily you can make up some track position. And for a lot of drivers, Evan, I think the response is that you have to go early. Everybody's going to ride around. You think maybe there's a little bit of ease into some of these moves that these drivers are making. So you want to make up that ground quickly before everybody gets too aggressive. It's kind of one of the balances about super speedway racing in general that, yes, it's so it's easy to ride around. And I even know a lot of high racers, including myself, that have employed that same strategy at super speedways. Problem is, if you ride around and it gets a little bit too late, everybody's pushing. And by then, it's much, much more difficult to make up some spots. When you talk about making moves, the driver who won this race a year ago was Tucker Minter, and he had the most quality passes out of anybody. It took 43 quality passes to get the job done. He's going to need some help. Let's listen in and go on board with the Logitech G on board camera. So not a lot to cooking in the kitchen for the 97 to mentor for the moment because he sits in 40th and he is watching everybody else making those moves. So clearly your defending race winner seems like that he is not in too much of a rush early on, but he knows how to get the job done. He will get to that point. And the onboard perspective there was cool seeing how much banking these cars are working with in the corners. And I mentioned it is the 15th season of this eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. If you want to stay up to date with the latest news from around the world of eNASCAR, then scan the QR code on your screen and stay in the loop with iRacing, the official simulation partner of NASCAR. Almost already 10 laps down in this race. Cozy is getting cozy at the front of the field. He continues to lead. You know, one thing it doesn't surprise me to see is Minter riding at the back like that. You know, that's one of the strategies that I really love implementing in real life, but I also really find it interesting to see who plays that strategy because what you're doing there is you're just vibing. You're just hanging out, waiting for everybody else to make their mistakes. And once those mistakes happen, you kind of have the ample amount of time to slow down, avoid the chaos, and find your way uh, gaining a couple of positions. So uh, smart strategy here. It's going to be interesting to see how he works his way back up to the front. We see the five car on the inside of the racetrack right there. Zach Novak in line. The Oxygen Esports entry. Coke Zero Sugar colors on that car. Uh, another one of those fun pairings, Blake, of a new team coming to the series. But you talk about a stalwart and a series veteran in Zach Novak, who has been around the block and then some a 2019 series champ. He's in the thick of things right now as they're three wide right to his outside. You got a bunch of champions in this little pack. You have Steven Wilson, who's just in front of him. Of course, our reigning series champion. And we talked about it leading into the broadcast. Four time uh, is right in the middle right there, trying to make some moves. In fact, I ran the A Open that a lot of these Coke Series drivers are running in last night. Guess who won that race? This 69 car right here, Ray Alfala. So somebody that is certainly going to be uh, reckoned with. And you can see he's trying to make this middle line work. And... I think, especially here, you can see how much movement is in these cars, especially in the center. That's, you know, that's one thing that iRacing does so well with the side draft and a lot of the aero movements of this car, Ryan, is that especially when you're in the middle, you're feeling the air from those cars on the top, those cars on the bottom. It's why you see so much twitching, especially when you're in the middle line. Yeah, I mean, you hit on it perfectly there. I mean, when you're in the middle, you're getting all the turbulence with the car, the outside the car, and the inside. You're getting side drafted on both ends, right? So it's the most unstable you are. And plus, there's no room for error. I mean, we talk about how wide Talladega is, but Daytona, there's a whole lane missing. There's there's no room to move around. So when you're in that middle lane, as we see, uh, it looks like Malik Ray hopping into the middle lane there. No surprise there. Um, it's, it's just so much more of a risk. So you're definitely playing a fine line there, uh, trying to work yourself up. But... Uh, it's no surprise to see some of the faces we see working our way through there. 
Hey, that was some dicey stuff down the back. You call that Malik Ray. He was leading the middle lane. Then Kwame Scott pulled in, tried to take that line away. Malik immediately undercut him right back down to the inside. Then the outside started checking up. All of that on the super stretch, which is probably the calmest spot on the racetrack. And that's not saying a bunch because they get a little bit extra room to be able to work around. You go on board there with the 66 machine of Colin Keister. He now leads the bottom lane. That's the Tony Kanaan entry. Micro Center on that Toyota Camry. Of course, I racing updating to those 2024 body styles for the Toyotas and Fords who saw changes in the offseason and it may be a bit of a different camera angle for Colin. I don't see as much mirror checking as we saw when we were watching some of the other drivers leading lines earlier in this race. He looks pretty calm though, all things considered. The inside lane, about four car lengths or so behind the top side, which has been pretty consistently the place to be thus far. That car pushing him behind is the 45 of Michael Guest. I'd say a little bit of smile there. He's having a good time. And you mentioned the new bodies. And, you know, that's one thing kind of coming into this weekend, both uh, both here at iRacing and in the real world, is that these cars are laser scan bodies of what actual NASCAR next-gen cars are running. And, you know, there's kind of been this going theory, at least recently, that it's a little bit easier to push if you're in a Ford or you're in a Toyota. So those Chevy's drivers, even here in iRacing, may be uh, kind of up to task or tough to task to be able to try and make sure that they – get center and push that car in front of them forward. The QR, QR code on the right-hand side of your screen, we talked about it in Countdown to Green. A lot of updates coming to iRacing, including Millbridge Speedway. Rain is finally coming. I know I can't wait for that and so much more. There's a very detailed blog post if you want to learn more about all the intricacies and everything that is going into some of these new updates. You can scan that QR code on the right-hand side of your screen and read all about it. He has some new cars as well coming to the service. The Delara 324, that's kind of a little brother to the SF23. Uh, the Dirt Micro Sprint's coming. That's going to be free to all iRacing members. The SRX car's coming. And even more updates to the uh, NASCAR bodies with the Xfinity Series cars being updated to 2024 spec as well. You're on board with Kerwin there in the middle. And you can see this is where it gets sketchy when there is not an established inside, middle, and top. That staggering is always going to be a position that it makes you uncomfortable and they are three wide now top to bottom now there's not a lot of room yeah i mean oh god and that's Whoa. a massive wiggle we got one on the apron there it's gonna merge his way yeah cody bias in that 27 car works his way back up onto the racetrack you saw it i mean it's just nothing but stacks up stack up on stack up i mean malik ray it's no surprise to see him trying to work his way to the front but uh, unfortunately he's the victim of circumstance there just lots of stacking that's the product of this type of racing right you don't know where the run's gonna come one car barely saved it. That was Tyler Gary. He collected it. No yellow. He didn't spin. Uh, but unfortunately for him, he's going to lose the pack. And the rest of the field is going to drive away from him. So he's going to need something to happen up here. So a close call. We get away with that one. You mentioned Gary drops out to the back. He's not the only driver who lost touch with the draft. The likes of Minter, Zelensky, and Lopez checked up a bit. They're in danger of losing the lead pack. I don't think quite in that spot yet. But... It goes to show we had been pretty consistently too wide through the field with kind of those cars in the high teens three wide for what the last 10 laps and in about a quarter lap that three wide charge came up and it goes to show you how quickly that intensity can flip the switch and get to a breakneck pace like it was there. Daniel Falkenham in the end finds himself now leading the outside line in the Interstate Batteries 54 Toyota pushed by Ottinger and Wyatt Tinsley third car in line top side but here comes Cozy on the bottom. Bottom, the 38 car charging back in front. That's courtesy of the assist to Seth the Merchant. They've been working together all night long. And let's take a second look. We talked about Tyler Gary to the near wreck for the 42 car. So you see him getting checked up right there. Tyler Gary, he's great for the checkup right here. There's going to be a big stack. And oh, right there, just clipped in the left rear quarter panel. Nice save to get the handle on that race car. He's able to just merge back up into the traffic. Unfortunately, uh, I believe we lost a draft. So, uh, tough break there but better than wrecking <laughs> i've seen many cars get on the apron like that into turn one 
and they can't get it low down or under control in time to blend back up onto the surface. So the initial save on the snap, Ryan, impressive, but I think I'm almost more impressed by the ability to blend it back up onto the banky. Now, to your point, lost the draft that's going to hurt him, but it certainly could have been worse. Yeah, it could have been very worse. I mean, the name of the game here at Daytona is survive and finish, right? As we talk about some of the chaos that's been going on, I want to look at one of the big, biggest chargers here, Casey Kerwin. Him and his teammate Malik Ray have been fighting their way to the front. Obviously, Malik got caught up in that stack, but Casey Kerwin has worked himself all the way up into now the second position is making a charge on the inside with a push from uh, Graham Bowen. So just an interesting set of circumstances here. We talked about a little bit earlier, Blake, about how that middle lane is so uneasy, but Casey's been in that middle lane pretty much half this race, it seems like. Well, and he's had to kind of scratch and claw and do everything he can to try and get up towards the front of the field. And, and you know, a lot of people, especially those that he's working with, including his new teammate in Malik Ray, if you've been on iRacing for any period of time, you know, there's death taxes and then there's Malik Ray spotting while he's driving and trying to call out when runs are happening. Hey, everybody check up. You know, that's just part of what he does. And honestly, I think it's part of the reason that that last wreck that Tyler Gary was involved in wasn't worse. He was right around there and of course, you know, He's uh, he's a, he's able to let people know what he's thinking, or if some run is forming, or if something's happening in front of him. Unfortunately, he got the bad end of it. But even since then, he's already worked his way back up to 17th. Yeah, but now we see how strong that outside lane has become. You got Descent in third, uh, Demerchant in second, and Makosi, another uh, common denominator here, uh, Michael Cozy Jr. up. Uh, has so much super speedway racing prowess. Uh, he's just been able to really command this race, whether it's the top lane or the bottom lane. It's, he has Seth the Merchant to his rear bumper. Seth is a rookie in this series, but we know he's a good speedway racer, right? I mean, he's done such a good job throughout the clash and now giving Cozy a nice shove along the top side lane. So, Evan, I mean, uh, this has been pretty interesting, but common denominators at the front. Yeah, they've been up there the entire time. And the fun thing about this is this is the start of Daytona week on the service and in real life. But the best part is you don't have to be in the eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series to race here at Daytona because this weekend is the iRacing Daytona 500 special event. There are plenty of splits and times available for both fixed setup races and open setup races for anybody with a Class C or higher oval license on the sim so you can get in your own full-length Daytona 500 here on the iRacing service that's going to be going on all weekend long here on the sim. We'll have some special iRacing Daytona 500 coverage as well later on this week. And Ryan, are, are we going to see you jump into the mix here for the iRacing 500 at some point? You're, Blake, too? I mean, you guys eyeing it up? Look, I mean, I love super speed racing, especially with this next-gen car. I love being able to make some big shoves. So uh, if I have some time this week, I might hop in there. I might have a little bit of fun. We'll see what we can do. Blake, what are you feeling? For sure. I've been I've been running the Daytona 500 on iRacing since uh, the car tomorrow, and you had the two-car tandem days way back in the day. Uh, something that's always fun. And th there's a lot of special events throughout the year that are pretty uh, fun to be a part of, especially on the NASCAR side, some of the crown jewels that run full-length races. But yeah, Daytona, definitely got to get at least one and maybe two if I can't help it. Well, I'll stick to Carb Cup, and I'll let you guys enjoy the Daytona 500. <laughs> it is a grueling one. I've done some of the 24-hour road races. Uh, the iRacing and special events calendar truly is a ton of fun. you got full-length Daytona 500, Coke 600, so much more. So if you're a member on the service, uh, make sure that you look for those dates to come up and participate. And even if you're new to the iRacing service and think of signing up, keep those on your watch list as what you want to accomplish in sim racing here in 2024. Maybe a small opportunity for these drivers to take a breath. There is still three wad. It's back there with Malik Ray. I'd honestly be more surprised if I looked for the seven car, and he wasn't three wide at any given moment, or his teammate at least back there in uh, the seven, and then the 77 occur went a bit further up, but staying too wide at the front, not as much movement up, down, laterally, vertically. I don't know if these drivers are trying to get to the next fuel cycle pit window, but things appear to be a tad more calm. Still movement. There's aforementioned 77, jumps up top side so they're certainly not complacent, but uh, those top three or four cars on the outside, they're just riding around right now and controlling things. Well, you know, those, the, go ahead. <laughs> well, those top three cars, the more that I watch them, you know, this is kind of the big difference between this week and last week was the fact that this is an open setup race. That these drivers are allowed to tune their cars to their liking. And the one thing that I've seen, and, you know, we have a little bit of a run here forming with Parker White, but consistently that uh, trio with, between Cozy, Demerchant, and Doucette, they can just 
hook up and pull away completely from that line. They'll eventually work their way back, but you know, this is one thing that's gonna make this race a little more difficult. This is what, why you're gonna have to try to break them up though. You wanna break up this trio of cars that's working so well together because if they get hooked up, you, you almost can't pass them. Yeah, a near wreck, Ryan Doucette, Ryan tried to get down to the inside of the racetrack and kind of hip check the car that was there. He was desperately trying to get a spot in line. He nearly took out Garrett Lowe, who got shot off to the apron down the super stretch. He's able to blend back in and not lose touch with the draft, but that was another near incident that we get away with. Closing in on halfway home in this first race of the eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. We'll see if we can get a second look at that near incident incident that's been two of them so far that we've gotten away with let's watch the 55 car mm, yeah falkingham just jumps to the top side there uh <laughs> just said was not ready for that move and uh now he's stuck in the middle there and just nowhere to go and squeezes oh my goodness gets into garrett low there on the inside garrett low nice save getting over the over the curbing there of the bus stop so uh, a bit of chaos there in the middle but uh all, all, all in all everybody keeps it together and another squeeze there. <laughs> Yeah, I was talking about some 24-hour races here on the service. The bus stop is exclusively for the 24-hour race here at Daytona, not for the 500-miler, and he just about took it unwillingly. A good save there, though, and the battle for the race lead is back on. Parker White in front. We will take an opportunity to step aside. You're watching iRacing's coverage of the eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. Each year, NASCAR begins its season during Black History Month and recognizes the accomplishments of past and present icons within the sport. From Sam Bell Navis, one of the first black corporate executives, to Bubba Walls, the first black driver to earn multiple wins within the NASCAR Cup Series. Milestones like these continue to drive our sport's future and we are proud to celebrate them all year long. Every time you sit behind the wheel, you buckle up for the unexpected. You get ready to take on the competition, embrace yourself for the chaos, the speed, the weather, the unknown. But above all, when strapping in, you put trust in yourself, your intuition, making your guide to win, your drive to win. He's a winner in this. And nothing is going to stop you from winning. When you want to be the best, you can't settle for the rest. For anything on iRacing, there's just one name you need, Mo Cody. We now provide the best of the best in setups, paint schemes, coaching, broadcasting, and event organization. With cars across all four license classes, we have what you need to hit the track with confidence. Grab a subscription and save money while going fast at MaconeSetupShop.com forward slash subscriptions. And remember, at Maconey Setup Shop, there are setups, but your victories. Is this the start of a dynasty? Ryan Blaney is an NASCAR Cup Series champion. A redemption tool. Ready to go to work. Is this the face of a ruthless competitor or a villain? I'd be your favorite driver. Is it time for a breakthrough? Let's go! To get back to breaking stuff? Hey, or is this the makings of the wildest ride you'll ever witness? It's all of the above, and it's about to go down. Any questions?
And back live at iRacing's virtual Daytona International Speedway, where coverage of tonight's race is brought to you by Coca-Cola Zero Sugar. Is it the best Coke ever? Try and decide. By Logitech G. Through design, engineering, and a love of driving games, Logitech G takes racing simulation to another level. Logitech G, the official wheel and pedals of the eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing series. By Sunoco. From fueling your favorite NASCAR teams to filling up at the pump, Sunoco is trusted to help vehicles perform at their peak. Sunoco, performance is what we do. And by McConey Setup Shop. Our setups, your victories. We are 32 laps down, soon to be 48 laps to go at the start finish line. This time by, it had been the Michael Cozy Jr. Show for the longest time, leading a whopping 21 laps. But as we stepped aside, Parker White took things over and continues to lead the outside Blake as we continue to await that trip down pit road. And I think, you know, these are, or Parker White is a car that these two of Cozy and DeMerchant have kind of brought into their group if you if you could speak or if you could say and you know the one thing that you're able to prove in these super speedway races the longer you're able to stay up front with the fact that we have open setups is yes there is a small difference in the cars and whether you could stay up front how much speed you have and that's something the rest of the field can take note of we've seen a lot of comers and goers so far that have been able to make their way to the front of the field and eventually fall on back but yet here at the front it's pretty much been the same group of three or four drivers that have held steady the entire time and uh, i think parker white has kind of moved his car amongst the field up in that echelon we talk about some of the new teams in the series this season and how about we go on board with Garrett Lowe in the BS competition of a scene. Both he and Jordy Lopez driving for the new team that is only new in terms of the E-NASCAR sense, but they've been around some of the top levels of sim racing for quite some time. The German-based team has fielded competitive entries in the Porsche Tag Heuer Esports Super Cup and others across the platform, and they are making their E-NASCAR debuts here in 2024. Picked up a good driver in Garrett Lowe, who's been pretty consistent started p16 and was scored p14 the last time by so he's been hanging out in that top 20 or so and hasn't had a ton of movement quite yet speaking of guys working their way to the front colin bowden uh, letting the mullet hang on that inside lane, getting a nice push for Derek Bordeaux. Uh, they've kind of worked their way towards the front here. Bordeaux's been giving some really solid shoves uh, to the rear bumper of that Ford Mustang. So um, that's, that's one to keep an eye on here. Uh, Bowden, he doesn't have any fear. That's that's one thing for sure. And uh, he has a lot of uh, a lot of good things to work on for the year. Uh, like we talked about in the beginning of the race, uh, this race is 80 laps, the distance 200 miles, pit road speed is 55 miles per hour, and pit lane time is around 35 to 40 seconds. Three sets of tires available for these drivers. However, the pit window is 38 to 42 laps. We are on lap 36. We are getting close to pit stops here, uh, Blake and Evans. So it's going to be really interesting to see who comes with who and who pits all together. And that field window is entirely dependent on kind of where you've been. If you're up at the front of this pack, you're probably going to be two or three laps short. I know when I was running in the A Open with these drivers last night, 45 was about the, the longest you could go if you were just kind of sitting around fourth or fifth in line in your respective line and kind of lifting a ton and being a part of the pack. But it's definitely going to shorten up, especially when you think about White, Cozy, uh, some of these drivers that have been up towards the front of the field are going to be a little bit shower than that. We're well, talking about drivers who have been at the front. Dylan Alt started this race in fourth, but right now he's in the Hornets' nest, mid twenties. Let's go on board with the Sunoco onboard camera with Dylan Alt.
Well, that onboard, a great perspective to pick up on two things. Number one, you talk about that fuel saving. If you're in the back, you are not full throttle. You're constantly having to feather that throttle, get out of the gas. You're going to run through the cars in front of you. What that does is it results in some fuel savings. The other end of that, though, Ryan, is how much movement is going on. They are not just locked into two rows and riding around. Everybody jockeying for position at any given moment. Yeah, and speaking of movement, we saw Parker White jump to that inside, but we, but you mentioned it, Dylan All, you know, riding that throttle, you know, I remember racing at Talladega and Daytona in the Xfinity Series and feeling, and being able to run half throttle when you're running in the mid-20s, mid-30s, you know, you don't have to worry about being full throttle because the draft from the cars in front and behind you is going to hold you up there, but we see the inside line starting to form here, so I think we're going to start seeing some pit stops here in a moment. Hey, Blake, we're almost on the number. Going to be 39 down this time by. You mentioned that little bit of tolerance there. Would we see drivers maybe yield to the longer side here or come in sooner? Well, I, I think it depends. If you're cozy, if you're the merchant, you really have no option. You're going to have to get down. And I wouldn't say that many of the drivers are going to pit this time. You just want to be proactive and get down to the bottom because the last thing you want to do is have to pit on a certain lap and there, there's no room for you to get down. And you have to kind of be on the bottom to be able to safely get it uh, get it down onto the pit lane. So uh, being proactive here, I'm sure some of these drivers at the front of the field, but I think in response to that, you'll see some drivers that have been hanging out that maybe have two or three extra laps of fuel. They're going to kind of charge to the front knowing that everybody else is going to kind of check up and try to find their way down to the bottom and be able to make up some time. There's quite a balance to find here. One, you need to pit with a bunch of race cars so you can blend back out and be in the draft. But also, if you pit with too many cars, it's going to be pretty sketchy. Getting on in the pit lane, cross flags in the air this time. No takers from up front. We are 40 laps down and 40 laps to go in this Daytona season opener. Three wide through the middle. It's a big charge. Nick Ottinger rockets back out to the race lead for a moment. That massive shove from Jimmy Mullis there. I think what they're trying to do here is tandem up so they can clear the inside. Yes, they are right there. Right as I say that, they move back to the inside line. Nick Ottinger was in a tough spot right there. He was top of three for what seemed like two or three laps there. And I know with pit stops coming up, that's the last place you need to be. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens here. It looks like we're going to get some guys forming up here. Couple of team cars lined up. Travis Pastrana's Nitro, Nitro Circus Sim Racing team for the 99 and the 41 are top side. But here we go. Takers to pit road. First car down and in the quick trip. Number 20 car for service. And look at them all on pit road. Tinsley, Falkenham, Cozy, Demerchant, White, Strauss, Hurst, Mains, Wilson, and Olatimbosin down pit road. It's about a third of your field. That looked pretty clean, guys. Getting down to pit road speed here at Daytona. A 55 miles an hour now we'll see if the rest of the field responds immediately and if they can do so just as cleanly and this is the most important juncture of a race super speedway racing that goes green it almost always comes down to green flag pit stops especially here with these next gen cars these guys are going to take four tires underneath the pit stop they're going to add as little fuel as possible to be able to get to the end maybe add a green white checkered on top of that and that's it they're going to come down they may make a little contact you also have to hope that nobody gets caught speeding at all but you have to be able to get in execute don't overshoot your box leave in about three or four seconds or however long you're going to take fuel for and then you're going to see kind of these mini packs come out but you don't want to have a bad pit entry because you'll lose the group that you pit with so another third of the field comes in that time scott alt delaney and company and everybody else who now has assumed the lead spots these remaining 14 cars saying that they're going to be pitting in this time. Kwame Scott noting to everybody, hey guys, I'm pit stall number one. I need to yield left because I got to stop sooner than all of you. And here almost all of them come. Only four drivers will stay out. Ottinger leads that group of cars in. Duval, Mullis, Doucette, Laprade, Lau, Alfala, Busa, and Luza in. Zwack was able to get into the number one pit stall. And this leaves only those four race cars of Keegan Leahy, Tucker Minter, Jordy Lopez and Bobby Zelensky. Yeah, and the beauty of this is with only four cars, you can get a lot more aggressive going on the pit road, right? It's a smaller group here, so yes, you've got to work a lot harder together to try and not lose any time. However, when you're coming on the pit road here, you don't got to worry about those cars next to you. So these guys are going to make a pretty heavy charge on the pit road coming up right here off the floor. 
Just as they start to catch some of the lap traffic, they are not going to head down pit road. They're going to continue to draft on a bye. They will put the 33 car of uh, Taylor Hurst a lap down. It's also going to put Cody Bias a lap down. In theory, I would think, Blake, four cars. You talk about they can be more aggressive, but is four cars going to be slower than the group of, say, 12 who has already pitted, got out there and into a draft? I mean, the longer they stay out, are they hurting themselves? Or is trying to pad the extra fuel you're going to have better for this second stint? I think four is the smallest group that I would want. When you think about, yeah, 12 cars should be faster in line, but they're having to lift, they're checking up, they're doing all those things. They're not entirely organized. So I think as long as you can stay organized, somebody didn't know Zach Novak was pitting, and in fact, he wasn't. He just got hit in the back. He was able to save it, but again, with how this cycles out, that's probably the last thing he wanted. He's likely going to lose the group that he was with. Finally, we had this lead pack of cars come down, but you know what we were talking about? They're going to have the benefit. They have less fuel to add than the rest of the field, so they may be able to leapfrog this entire pack uh, if they were able to make up some time there. Jimmy Mullis also down pit road to serve a penalty. He's back down. Uh, Matthew Zwack also back down pit road for a second time. And now we'll watch and see those four cars who pitted are now blending back up onto the racetrack off of pit road. But they're only at pit exit. And look at these cars that have been in the big draft. It is going to be a world of speed difference as they blend back out onto the racetrack there. They're trying to get up to speed here. The penalty, by the way, pit exit when drivers were trying to get in line. But you're going to see these four cars on the apron here down the back straightaway. There they are. They're going to blend up onto the racetrack. But that pack behind them has got a 30-mile-an-hour oh, speed difference. Look out. The 45's onto the apron. They're going to go four wide here. And they're going to have to absorb that line at a much different speed. Malik Ray was the one that somehow saved it. And, well, it looks like they're going to be able to maintain their spot. And you saw the rest of the field trying to react to that group of cars. It looks like everybody's okay for now. But, ooh, that could have been a disaster. I certainly thought it was going to be worse, Ryan, for the cars that were slower on the apron. But I think if those cars that were already in the big pack were too wide and they were just able to uniformly go on by, they probably would have cycled to the back. But that near wreck caused a lot of them to check up and to Blake's point, kind of forced them to absorb those cars on the bottom. And now they're right back in this thing, even with everybody else. I was about to mention, yeah, that worked out perfectly for those guys that pitted in that smaller group. But uh, you mentioned earlier how it's no surprise to see Malik Ray, middle of three, or doing all, you know, being in certain situations. He was the one that was sideways there. He was the one that got, you know, clipped there. And uh, he's just, he, he is so aggressive on these super speedways. And that's what makes him so good at it. He has no fear. And I, I mean, yeah, he's in the back again. But I don't know. I'll see him in 20 laps. He'll probably find his way to the front again. And you talk about finding your way to the front. Seth Merchant has been up front for most of this race, but that time by first lap led in his NASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series career, one of four true rookies in the field this season. And I know we had an exhibition race here at Daytona a couple of weeks ago, but race one, first lap led of his career. He's been a factor all night long. Good to see the 14 car is a nearly a bad push for the 97. Going to open up the door for this challenge on the bottom, the 48 to Grand Bolin, pushed by the 90 car. There to the left there as you go on board with Femi Alatimbosin, top oh, side, man. third car in line. Look at the slam drafting going on in the middle, Blake. Grand Bolin made a very aggressive block, and, you know, we're getting to that point. You see somebody that has a huge run, and instead of just letting them go like we saw earlier in the race, he threw a massive block, nearly got spun, uh, but he was able to hold it. And, Ryan, these next-gen cars, that is one thing that they are pretty well known for is they are pretty sturdy. You can give them some pretty aggressive shoves without much penalty. Yeah, I mean, we talked about the aggressive shove there, but, I mean, look at look at this. It worked. Grant Poland's your leader. Uh, Steve Wilson's in second. You know what I mean? The, those aggressive shoves are what's going to make the difference here tonight. And, oh, and now we're going three wide through the middle here. I mean, and another driver we talked about earlier, Tucker Minter, he was riding around in the back as they're stacking. They're four wide. They're stacking. They're like, go. Oh, it's getting Will all out of shape. It? Spinner down to the inside of the wow. racetrack. Do we stay green? We do. Pulling it back up onto the racetrack is Dylan Alt. No caution. I cannot believe that. That was middle of four wide at Daytona. And this place has barely enough for three and a half. So uh, props to all these guys for holding on to it in that chaos. 
And what that chaos does is kind of split that pack in two. So it opens the door for more chaos. Drivers trying to take advantage. Leading the middle lane now is Seth the Merchant pushed by the 97 machine of Tucker Minter. Look at Kerwin. He'll go top side of the middle, go to the inside lane. Now Bolin goes top the bottom only for a moment. Jumps right back to the middle. Those cars on the front working overtime, trying to manage all those lanes. You know, we have 25 cars at the front of this field, and they're being really aggressive. You know who really wants to see this? Nick Ottinger, Dylan Ald, a couple of other cars. There's about a group of four that's off this, let's call it about 22-car lead pack. There's probably three or four other packs that have formed up, and they want these guys to be two, three wide. They want the opportunity to get back in this race at some point. So they kind of need what we're seeing a lot of up here up front to be able to go to two or three wide, because three wide is a pack entirely they're going to go slower than then if they're in two lines or just one. Is the case. Oh, in big trouble. Crashing in turn number four. The first caution of the night. And it's at least a half a dozen race cars. Demerchant, who's been so good all night long, is involved. Jimmy Mullis. The three car also involved. Dylan Alt. And that one happened very quickly. And all of a sudden... This race is a whole new ball game inside of 30 laps to go as we finally see that first yellow on the night. And for all the missed opportunities and close calls, Ryan, it was only a matter of time. It was, I mean, you, you hit you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, it's it's only a matter of time, especially with some of the blocks, some of the moves you were getting, all the sack ups and check ups. Uh, Jordy Lopez scored as your leader here, but you know, we saw Seth the Merchant in there. I mean. Like these guys were some of the guys that were running up front, some of our contenders all throughout the race here tonight. But as you mentioned earlier as well, those smaller packs that kind of got broke off of this group, they were hoping and praying for that. So they, they're they sitting there, they're feeling great because now they have plenty of fuel, plenty of time and, and a clean race car. Let's take a second look, Blake, and try to figure this one out. It started in the middle lane, but there was contact in front of Demergent between the 34 and the 54 that kicked it all off. I was about to say, look at that Love's Ford that's on the bottom of the racetrack. This is really where th this entire wreck starts, and I think that's just a move. He may not have known that Falkingham was there in the middle or thought he was a little higher. It looks like he just made a lane change. It wasn't something where he hit the apron or anything. He just wanted to move over to the middle lane, and then, of course, Kwame uh, gets the worst in or, you know, gets a piece of it. This is on board of him. Olad is the one that got spun. You see on board the Latardi Sports Sunoco Chevrolet. How about uh, watching this happen in front of you? And somehow, it looks like he's able to avoid all of it. I was with you. Uh, they mentioned Kwame Scott, and I was thinking, oh, he's three wide. He certainly jumped in that one. And he got a little bit of damage, but was able to fight his way through. And Kwame Scott will drive to see another corner. Uh, not everybody's so fortunate. Again, a lot of damaged race cars in that one. Uh, they will come down pit road for service. It also looks like a decent amount of cars from the back of the field coming in for service anyways. I anticipate that those are likely fuel-based stops for those drivers to have a little bit extra for overtime. Part of me was thinking, Ryan, that maybe we would see some of the top cars come in, get a splash of fuel, but I think the fact that they all were able to pit a little bit after halfway and the yellow itself is going to give them some fuel saving opportunities. They feel like they're probably OK. So those pit stops limited to the cars towards the back just to get a little bit of insurance. Yeah, I mean, you talk about the insurance there, right? I mean, these guys are probably clutching and coasting, doing what they can to kind of get a little bit of fuel to have for the end there, right? But you look at like you look at last last race in the clash, right? right? White Tinsley started up front, ran up front all night, ended up winning the clash. Track position is going to be key here. So if I'm Jordy Lopez, Graham Bol Bolin, Key Leahy, why pit? You know what I mean? Why put myself in the middle of that hornet's nest? So I, I agree with their move, but I also agree with those folks in the back there. You know, let's get that fuel because hopefully these guys up here wreck. And something tells me when you get one yellow late in the race, you'll probably get a couple more. All right, then it's off to Blake. He's got your current race leader, Jordy Lopez, on the radio. Well, Jordy finished on the podium a couple of weeks ago at the Clash, and you called your shot that you're going to be up here at the front of the field uh, late in the going, 28 laps to go. What do you anticipate here in this final uh, home stretch to the finish? Um, it's going to be crazy. We're going to be three wide. It's just going to be about um, just trying to find, like, the right lane. Um, 
positions switch pretty quickly here, so me being in the lead, it, it doesn't really mean too much at this point of the race. Uh, I'm just going to try my best to bring home like great points and just get done with this because it's pretty, uh, pretty nerve-wracking for me. <laughs> I know Daytona is all about making friends. Have you been able to make some, or are you looking for some uh, to try to help you get to the end here? Well, I haven't crashed anyone yet, so um, I, I think I'm in the clear for now. <laughs> all right. Well, good deal, Jordy. We'll let you get back after it. Best of luck to you. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. So that's one half of the all-new BS competition team. The nomination of Jordy Lopez going to be restarting in the top spot for this upcoming restart. His teammate Garrett Lowe, a little bit of work to do, coming off of the pit lane in 24th. Now, beneficial to myself and Ryan is we will not get old take exposed because our picks are not on the record. Blake, yours, on the other hand, going with Wyatt Tinsley in the pre-race discussion on Countdown to Green. He's in P7. He's looking pretty good. Yeah, he is. Uh, but again, like Jordy said, a lot can change here in the last 28 laps. If it was a two-lap uh, race to the end, a lot could change in that. But Minter, 36th, Wyatt Tinsley in P7. We're, we're looking pretty solid right now in the Quick Trip Toyota. Yeah, your car's got all four fenders on it. Uh, Camille and Allen's does not. It's on the jack on pit road. So could always be worse. I know it's a long season, but I don't, maybe they colluded um, against themselves. I know that was the, the topic of the conversation right. on Countdown to Green. So a couple of cars unable to make it back on track for the restart. Minter, Olatz, and Bosun, Duval, Mains, and Demerchant getting continued repairs. Some of them going to try to catch up to the field and leave you with a lead pack. Still 30-something car strong. Lopez will be the control car for this one to the outside of the front row, the 48 car of Graham Bolin. Green flag back in the air, 26 laps to go. Just like the initial start of the race, the outside line through the gears and up to speed better. Car length advantage for the outside line to turn two. Kind of big push to the rear bumper of Graham Bolin there. Uh, we see just a lot of shuffling around here right now. Everybody's just trying to work up to speed. You see Steven Wilson locked to the rear bumper of the 40 of the bullet, but the inside lane is a lot more formed up. So they're going to get a little bit of a run through here, but that top lane is going to fight back hard. Couple of cars shifting lanes. That 54 car of Falkenham Blake went to the outside. And again, you see these top couple of drafts break away. This will not be permanent. The rest of the field is going to catch them. The three wide right now. Let's ride on board with Dylan Duvall and experience what it's like to be three wide at Daytona. So there's your onboard look with Jonathan Delaney, notably not Dylan Duvalis. And we talk about all the new teams, the new numbers, the new paint schemes. Their last names both start with a D and they both drive red and white race cars, okay? It's a learning process for all of us. There'll be a quiz at the end of week 18. He's got a little bit of work to do though in the middle of that uh, P20 situation midfield, but maybe calm for the moment. Nobody has really forced the three wide yet off of this restart. And again, that question about fuel saving seems to be eliminated with that one yellow. So we're not going to see drivers conserving for the sake of fuel, I wouldn't expect. But, Blake, in a race like this, when's go time, right? We talked about the varying strategies. You go up front, you race aggressively all night. We've seen the likes of Divergent do that, and it not work. We've seen the likes of Parker White and Jordy Lopez do that, and it has worked to this point. But if you're hanging back, if you did not want to get up here, is now go time at closing in on 20 to go? 
I think so, and I think this mentality has kind of changed uh, both in real world uh, and even the sim racing world uh, a little bit here, especially with the next gen car. I think you kind of have to make your moves when you can. You can't really afford to, to sit around and ride. Or it's one of those things, Evan, I think as a driver, you're almost okay if you're going for it. A lot of things can happen, and there's going to be some drivers that likely end up wrecked at the end of this when we get down to the final lap, and that's okay, but I would much rather get wrecked racing for the win and making some moves and trying to go up front than just riding around in 25th and, and then getting caught in something, because then your strategy didn't work and you're upset because you didn't position yourself properly as well as you could have. Oh, a huge pinch. Oh, Another man. Time off What's of the that? corner. There goes Jordy Lopez into the outside wall. They'll scatter around him, though. No car spin. Several of them will go through the grass, but this race stays green. You can see all the separation that is right there. It just it totally broke apart this pack. Jordy Lopez did a good job just keeping his car up there out of harm's way. Really unfortunate for him. But now there's going to be a huge push for Bobby Z. Bobby Z. Big head of steam. Top side. Zelensky pushed by Briar LaPrade. First time we've talked much about those two cars tonight. They'll go to the race lead. Another big run now for the eight car, Caden Honeycutt. So the bank is open at the front of the field. Going for the race win in Daytona, Blake. But let's watch again what happened to Jordi Lopez wrecking from the race lead just talked about drivers making moves and this is Lopez trying to protect his spot at the front he gets a bad shove Leahy gets a bad shove from behind his 45 Toyota and or 23 Toyota rather and he's just not able to hang on to it and you know that's one of those things when we talk about these pushes and these shoves going awry it's not often the car that's directly behind you that's the cause of it it's the car that's behind the pusher you know pushing the pusher is tough but Evan you know there's something I want to point out 20 laps to go in 2004, Dale Earnhardt Jr. won the Daytona 500 in the 8. 2014, he won the Daytona 500 in the number 88. Both those cars are up front here with 20 to go. I don't know, maybe 2024 is the, is the right book into that. Something about those anniversaries. We'll see if those Jeter Motorsports machines can put it together. They're both inside of the top 10 now. Although that 88 car, LaPrad, for the moment, without help in the middle, he will fly by Caden Honeycutt topside and look for somebody to lend a helping hand. Not going to find it anytime soon. Is up front now to the race lead. It goes the number 20 car of Wyatt Tinsley. Being his first lap led of the afternoon. And some more new faces. Defending champ Steven Wilson, first time we've really called him out over the course of this race. He is in the conversation, second in line on the outside in the M80 Ford. I said earlier how we'd see him in about 20, 30 laps. He's back. He's in fourth on the inside lane. Malik Ray getting a huge push down to the inside from uh, Seth the Merchant here, but uh, what a comeback for a lot of these guys. I mean, you just see a lot of this stack up here, but now. We got some different faces at the front, right? Casey Kerwin now has control. Derek Bordeaux, Malik Ray trying to hold on to that inside lane. Uh, uh, Wyatt Tinsley. So interesting to see how this is all folding out, especially after that big stack. Just watching for where that next run is going to come from. Two by two for the moment. Kerwin leading the top side. Derek Porto in line behind. And Blake, you called out those Junior Motorsports cars. There they are. No longer top ten, but still very much in the mix with LaPrade and Honeycutt. I think that's what we've learned is that, yes, they were second and third. They were about to make a pass for the race lead. Here they are back in 14th and 15th, and who knows, probably in a lap. <laughs> they could once again be challenging for the race lead. That's just how crazy that this racing is here at Daytona. As you see, Graham Bowen almost getting out of shape just behind them. But another pair of team cars at the front of the field. Inspire Motorsports got to be pretty happy. Newcomers to this series, Malik Ray and Casey Kerwin, running 1-2 right now at Daytona. We've seen these two guys do this for so many years on the surface. No surprise to see them hooked up and at the front of the field. Yeah, they're doing a great job, but look at all the movement now. Back at about row number five, that 34 of Bordeaux, high to low. Now back to the middle. Late block oh, there man. for Garrett Maines to shut the door. He sucks it up. The 34 gives him another shunt, and while they'll survive that for the moment, the outside gets the advantage while they get things figured out. Now the 20 of Tinsley, the 10 of Wilson, they leave the outside. They'll come down to lead the bottom lane, coming to 16 laps to go, but still no 
nobody able to get two of those Spire Motorsport Chevys. One, two on the outside. Third car in line, the 27 of Bias. It's a lot of slam drafting going on through the field here, right? I mean, these guys are getting such huge runs. It's late in the game here. We're less than 20 to go. These guys are trying to get really desperate here. They're trying to form up their runs and work, find their friends. That's the biggest thing, too, is who are you going to work with right here? As you see Wyatt Tinsley and Steven Wilson get tandeming up right there on the bottom. So very interesting here as we ride on board with uh, Donovan Strauss here in the middle of the Hornet's Nest there, huh, Blake? <laughs> Strauss is in the middle of the Hornet's Nest. The two drivers that aren't are up front, and Malik Ray and Casey Kerwin. You have to kind of flash back to last year, Talladega Super Speedway. We know Kerwin had a shot to win at Daytona. He didn't, and it was Malik Ray who almost celebrated before he crossed the start finish line at Talladega. He thought he had his first Coke Series win in hand and unfortunately lost it at the last split second to the driver who was directly behind him in Casey Kerwin. So teammates this year but you got to remember if you're Malik Ray I'm sure he's hoping he can hang on here his improvement in the series last year was so well documented and what a statement it would be if he were finally able to go to victory lane but 15 laps still a long way to go for him to do that he's been fighting for some time to add his name to that illustrious list we've seen 64 different race winners in series history do we see a number 65 here tonight race still good top side tinsley goes bottom to mid he'll pull up in front of the 18 of zelensky and again try to work both those lanes but both the middle and the bottom do not have the numbers in cars that the outside lane has gotten that outside has consistently been about three four car lengths to the good now it's not going to last forever but they've been good thus far Derek Bordeaux is right in the middle of it all he needs the middle to get going if he wants to get out of this mess here he'll give a shove to the 38 car on Michael Cozy Jr. but again you got to keep pushing because the outside so good big sweepy move there down to the bottom I think that was the 53 car of Parker White Boy, what a run that they have. And you got to make these moves quickly. If you're going to work that middle lane, that's how those runs have to go. You have to do it. You have to make it happen immediately, or else you can see right there for Cozy, not able to get back down to the bottom. And I don't know if he'll be able to build that, that momentum again, but what a great run that the two front row motorsports cars had. You can see Cozy stuck in the middle, probably going to fall back a couple of rows, but a great move there for Bordeaux to get to that second car on the inside line. Yeah, that was going to be my same point there, Ryan. The front row cars were working together, the 34 and the 38, and then before Blake could even get to it, they left each other. 34 went down to the bottom and <laughs> took his own trip to the front. So you can come into this race to plan on working with your teammate, working with the other cars in your technical alliance. When it gets down to crunch time, I think you're taking who's available, though. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned it right there, you know, taking who's available. We, as you see, uh, Bobby Selinski jumped to the middle lane right there. But, you know, Cozy and Bordeaux were working really well together there in the middle. But as we've seen before, that middle lane is the danger zone. If you're stuck there in that middle, there's nowhere to go. But that seems like that middle lane is dying out. And Zelensky's going to try and squeeze the middle, but just gets hung out to dry. He was holding the middle, but the 45 behind him, and Michael Guest went low to work with Tinsley. Tinsley then left Guest to go back upside to work with Zelensky. So nobody in agreement on where the place to be to win this race is. You go on board with the Knights number 27 of Cody Bias. There's a look off in the back. You can see the speed. The inside has got, he's third car topside. It's tough for the 27 to do anything right now. You've got two teammates who have been pretty well working together right in front of you. And then oh the bottom's gosh. there. Oh, it's not going to work. They'll turn it into the outside wall. Goes Bolin. Caution comes out. Colin Keister involved. So is the 12 of Garrett Mains. And a second yellow on the night will take us inside at 10 to go. It was inevitable. I mean, they were just getting so aggressive with these pushes. We saw Graham Bolin get turned in the middle of the pack there. Uh, and that's just what a lot of these guys were waiting for, right? I mean, a lot of these guys were just trying to get that track position so that they could be either ahead or way the heck behind it. So uh, craziness happening here with just over 10 to go. And the replay will give us a better picture, Blake, but watching it live looked pretty similar to what we had seen in some of the previous accidents. That run comes and you just kind of get cars bouncing off each other. Eventually, someone's going to get out of shape and get hooked. 
Well, again, you need kind of an instantaneous reaction here. It's going to start, look back to our former series champ or defending series champ in Steven Wilson, that fourth car in line. He can't see the stack up that all three cars in front of him, Tinsley, uh, Zelensky, and Bolin, all kind of at the same time bounced off of one another. And unfortunately for Wilson, you just can't react to all of that contact instantaneously at once. And it happens in probably the sketchiest part of this racetrack, which is right in the trial, will very easy to get out of shape. You can see the rest of the field trying to scatter around some of the chaos. But yeah, that was a, a case of three cars stacking at the exact same time. And unfortunately for Wilson, I mean, we know that he knows how to drive these things, but even he can't react quickly enough to that. And Bowling gets the worst end of it. One element we always talk about this series, Ryan, the fact that all of these drivers have live spotters, live crew chiefs. They're not reliant on the automated spotter system on the service. But when it happens that quickly, you're pretty much on your own. Yeah, I mean, you can rely on spotters all you want or crew chiefs all you want. But at the end of the day, the best spotters are your eyes, right? You know, once that chaos happens in front of you, once you see that smoke, there's you, you really just have to try and predict where these cars will go. When it's in the corner, you know it's going to go high for a minute and then wash itself back down. But when it's in the trial, uh, we were on board with some cars there. And it's just it, it's impressive to see these guys try and swerve their way through. But uh, one thing I want to note here, uh, Blake, where's your pick running right now? Uh, I think we're showing him on screen right now, just behind the pace car, P1. Hopefully, uh, he keeps it up. Not a lot has changed in the last 10 laps or so, but uh, we're, we're looking good right now. I think you're going to want a, a piece of wood to knock on. Uh, let's talk more about some of the other drivers uh, in this one. We've got Graham Bullen on the radio with you, Blake. All right, Graham, see you trying to get that car. It looks like it's really difficult <laughs> to drive, even on the apron right here. But, Graham, any indication any of what was happening in front of you there? Uh, I mean, you just have to slam each other to go fast and slightly get out of line, and then we just accordion effect. So, unlucky because I was up there the whole night. So, it's frustrating, but it's Daytona. Like, at least we're up there fighting for the dub, I guess. Not almost crashing and <laughs> trying to face me around. Yeah, I was about to say, are you going to be able to hang on to this thing? I mean, it, it, this does not look like a car that wants to go straight. Yeah, we're going 160. So, I mean, I guess we're fine. Just got to. We look like it's a dirt track the whole time. A lot of skew. We're skewing. Well, there you go. Well, uh, you know, you, at least it'll be uh, aerodynamically you're looking good, but uh, mechanically not so much. But uh, we'll hope he can uh, can make that car uh, last to the end of this race. That's going to be a difficult task. Yeah, he, he's certainly the one, I think, who got the worst of that one uh, when that Price Chopper 48 car went up and into the outside wall and not going to get the result he was hoping for out of his Kansas City Pioneers machine. But... To the point we had made right before we were talking to him, it is his teammate in Wyatt Tinsley who is occupying the top spot in this race in the Quick Trip Toyota. So this yellow going to bring us, as mentioned, inside of 10 to go. If the lights go out this time by, we'll be looking at a seven-lap dash to the end. So all of the strategy that went into being aggressive or laid back, and remember when the pit stop strategy was a big conversation no more than 30 laps ago, none of that matters anymore. It is simply going to be a seven-lap race to the end, and we know that when you give them a short sprint to the end, who knows what is going to happen. Well, we talked about teams. How about the team that is working good on the top side, the Spire Motorsports car, the 77 at Kerwin, the 7 of Malik Ray. Blake, you got both of them. Well, guys, we're pulling you in as teammates here. I know you got to start to be individuals at some point, but you're both lined up here on the outside row. You guys have raced each other for such a long time. You, you almost know what the other one's going to do before it happens. But I don't know. I'll just be quite frank about it. Who do you think is going to come out of top out of you two? Hopefully uh, both of us at the same time. <laughs> yeah, if that's the, the <laughs> best case scenario. Yeah, a tie would be yeah, great. Like a, uh, yeah, main goal is Aspire Car in victory lane. Hopefully... Uh, I mean, it's going to be chaos. We're going to try and stick together, but, I mean, runs just come left and right. It's, it's hard to. We'll see how it works out. And, uh, yeah, main goal is to get a Spire car in victory lane, and hopefully we can yeah, get that done. All right, guys, we'll let you go with seven laps to go. The seven car up front. We'll see if the 77 pushes him, or perhaps something else can happen. Well, they've got the best seat in the house. Um, we have seen on the starts, they've been pretty clean, all things considered. Um, the inside, obviously, where the control car sits, but the outside, Blake, has seemed to establish position better, right? Get that advantage down the back stretch a little bit better. So would you rather be the 7 and the 77 top side or Tinsley on the bottom? 
You know, I, we've seen the outside line be really, really strong uh, on these starts, so I, I'm I'm having to think that that's probably where we can go uh, to be consistent. Again, it's that middle lane where you're really having to make moves and guys are having to dive to the middle. I think that favors the top side. You're not to worry about uh, being side drafted down to the bottom like if you're uh, stuck there on the inside. Pace car going to begin this time with seven laps to go at Daytona. Tinsley and Ray on the front row looking to start the 2024 season with a ticket to the playoffs. Looking for the green flag back underway in Daytona. It's a big jump for Tinsley, but maybe a big jump to a fault. No, he's able to get topside. Tinsley snatches the outside line. That was a very smart move to jump out to the top, that top side there. He has the Spire cars lined up two and three right behind him. Tinsley trying to hold on a really, really good push here from Malik Ray. Uh, I don't know how it's going to work out down the back stretch here. You see Zelinski getting a huge shot from Steven Wilson on that inside lane. Still two by two. Who's going to be the first car to put it in the middle? Three wide, at least up front. Outside, led by Tinsley. Inside, led by the 18 of Zelinski. Just those couple of moments of being able to hook up is going to pull the inside lane through. Is the wrecking further back in the field? Looks like Garrett Lowe, one of the cars involved. And that'll put us under caution and close to what might be an overtime finish. Oh, and the wrecking after the oh. caution as well. Dylan Alt gets wrapped up in it. A twofer. Ryan Lewis a confused as they had the accident in turn number four and then wrecked again on the front straightaway. Luza involved in both of those. And he's a little bit stunned on the radio. It's a two for one special. We'll wind it back and watch what actually brought out the yellow and tough for Luza in regards that we haven't talked a ton about him tonight up until this point in the race. And well, not really the reason you want to be talked about. The 2017 series champion was on the bottom lane. They were too wide, but things just started to get a little bit of that movement up and down, up and down. And you'll see the 80 car get turned and then the, the green and white car behind him in the 89 machine a low who goes all the way around right there. Just a big shove gone wrong there, right? Right. The 89 gets a huge push from that from that 90 car and just get there's nowhere to go, right? Once you're once you have the rear tires that drop the ground, as you would see Keegan Leahy's on board right here. You see that inside lane just stack up and oh, does he get through it? Yes, he does. Cuts right back down to that apron. Nice job avoiding that one by Keegan Leahy. The wreck then again later was simply those cars getting up to speed and lose a clipping a car that was involved in the accident. So the damage from that kind of second incident, um, minor in comparison to what happened in turn number four, but it may affect where those drivers will be scored in order. Of course, expecting them to be down pit road regardless to Merchant. Hurst, Luza, Bias, and more down pit road this time from the back of the field. Still none of these leaders opting to come down pit road. They made their one and only pit stop under the green flag just past the halfway point, and they have been out there since then. And this one's going to be close. We just took five laps to go. I'm anticipating this restart to come within regulation. So on the cusp of overtime, not quite there, likely a three-lap shootout. I think you're right about that, Evan. And once again, if you're tuning in for the end of this race, big news being dropped here on iRacing. You can scan the QR code on the right-hand side of your screen. A lot of updates coming. I want you to give, give you all the details on everything that's happening here on the service, as well as some big developments like Millbridge Speedway that is coming in this latest update with rain that is on the horizon. The one thing I'm looking forward to the most, you'll be able to look at the radar in the UI and be able to see how the weather changes throughout the course of a race, be able to set all these different things. I'm excited to learn all about it, too. If you want to know more, visit that blog with the QR code on the right-hand side of your screen, and you can learn all about everything that is coming up in iRacing. Exciting time uh, to hop onto iRacing. Long time coming, and I know you're going to be able to implement those weather changes 
in so many different ways, right? That rain can be implemented in a session in a fully dynamic, real-world, forecasted weather sense. Um, you could always pick a static weather and, and have it be the same conditions throughout, or you can actually uh, kind of pick and choose how you want the weather to change over the course of your session. So I know it's been a long time coming, but a long time coming for a reason to make sure all of those engineers on the iRacing end have got that dialed in. And again, that's what that blog post looks like, but scan the QR code on the right-hand corner of your screen and get involved. And of course, we mentioned it, but this race is only the start of Daytona Week, both here on the service and of course in the NASCAR world as well. The iRacing Daytona 500 special event is back later this week and this weekend plenty of different times to participate in both open and fixed setup races on the sim so if you want to participate in a full length 500 mile i racing daytona 500 make sure you participate in that special event this weekend as the i racing special events calendar kicks off blake i don't know you guys mentioned you're already going to be at least trying to participate in some of those blake says he's going to start two and win two i think that's an exact quote uh ryan you said you might give it a go uh, i will watch on and cheer you gents on yeah, with Daytona right around the corner. I'll be down there in Florida this weekend, hanging out with some friends down there, watching some racing. So it's going to be a good time down there. But if I have some time in the week leading up to it, I might have to hop on and do some of that. But I'm like you, Evan. I'm a car. I'm a carb cup guy, man. I'm hopping in there every <laughs> other day and getting down and getting exciting. And uh, it's always a bit crazy in those uh, carb cup races, but uh, it's always a good time. Well, as a as a Florida resident now too, I'll uh, be making my way to Daytona. And uh, I wish it was as easy as it's going to be on the iRacing service of picking and choosing when the weather comes around. We'll see what the race weekend looks forward to, but looking forward to it nonetheless. At least for the task here at hand, though, tonight, here we go. Lights are out on top of the pace car. Going to be coming to a restart with three laps to go. This is part of regulation. We are not yet in NASCAR overtime, but the rules are still pretty similar. You need to get to the white flag for this race to be official. If a caution comes before the white is displayed. We'll talk overtime procedure after that. Pace car down and in. Bobby Zelensky finds himself in control of the field with three laps to go. Green flag back in the air at Daytona. I don't know if I like Zelensky getting out to even that much of a lead. It's kind of interesting being the leader when you want to launch, but allows the rest of the field to get a little bit of a run. But for right now, Tinsley goes with them, although he's trying to make a move around him. Yeah, they looked like they were in sync, but it was really Zelensky just going up at the same time. Tinsley was trying to put the move on him. Inside, right back, the Spire cars are linked up. Malik Ray drafted with Casey Kerwin on the bottom, but the outside trio of Zelensky, Tinsley, and Wilson pulling a big gap on the rest of the cars in their lane. That might hurt them in the center of the corner. Yeah, it's three versus four here. Three on the top, four on the bottom. As they got a wreck in turn number four off. Oh, man, the vibe's around. Spinning. It looks like they all get the ship straighted pretty quickly, but it was Zach Novak in the Coca-Cola Zero Sugar Machine who was one of the drivers involved. I think the 42 car is the other one. Tyler Gary in the E-Racer entry may have been the first car to get spun out um, at the start of all of this. For Daytona's sake, pretty minor accident that time off of turn four, but enough of an accident nonetheless to trigger the fourth caution to flag in the afternoon, and we will indeed be headed to E-NASCAR overtime, as seemingly is a tradition in week one of the season. That it is, and I think you're just going to see a little bit of a bump go gone wrong. We saw these two cars. Well, guess what? They hit in the clash. They're going to hit here as well. Colin Bowden gets into the back of Tyler Gary, who honestly does a remarkable job in saving it. You could say the same about Zach Novak, who's able to get his car back from under him. But it's enough to trigger the caution flag and have to stack him up and try it once again. We were starting to see some of those dynamics come into play with Malik Ray, Casey Kerwin sticking to each other on the bottom, uh, going head-to-head -head against the likes of Bobby Zelensky and others. And speaking of which, we've got the driver of the 18 car, Blake, on the radio. Bobby Z, you said it's same goal this season to try to get back to the championship four and finally get that done. You have the opportunity to try and put yourself in a good position to make the playoffs here with a win here at Daytona. But look around you. You think you have the help or uh, the amount of uh, experience here to try to get the job done at Daytona? 
I definitely could do it. Um, I don't know how many friends I really have. Uh, my closest kind of friend out here that I work with behind the scenes is Ryan Doucette, but like, and Cozy's around there in ninth, but I think they might be a little too far. So I'm trying to work with Wyatt, Steven, and yeah, try to try to hold the outside here. I think we were doing pretty good there on that least last restart, but yeah, a little, little bit of a little bit of tense right now. Maybe a lot on the line here at Daytona, but uh, we can do it. Any either lane that you would kind of rather have here? I know you're stuck up on the top, but any place you kind of want to be, envisioning yourself taking the white flag here? Yeah, I mean, like the bottom's a short way around, so you think, ah, oh, you know, I'll go down there, but you just get side drafted way stronger on the right side of these cars, so I kind of rather be up here. Um, just because, you know, if you're on the bottom, you could be the two fastest cars pushing perfectly, but, you know, those outside cars know how to side draft well, you're kind of stuck usually, especially on a green-white checkered. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm cool with where I am, but I kind of just, you know, try not to make any stupid moves, be there at the end. All right, Zelensky feels like he's in a better spot on the outside. We'll lead them uh, from the outside road to green with White Tinsley in tow behind him. Good luck, Bobby. Remember how he got to that outside by getting the big jump on the inside of the racetrack and then very quickly sliding up to take that spot that he has clearly been hoping to get himself in. So we are now officially headed to eNASCAR overtime. Let's talk green, white, checkers. We will have three attempts to finish tonight's race under green flag conditions. When you take the green, it's two laps to go. If you make it all the way around to the white flag, this race is official and it will end under green no matter matter what first car to the checkered flag wins however if we do not reach the white flag and that being the leader getting to the stripe before a yellow were to come out we would go back under the caution period rack them again and try it again for a second attempt if we run out of attempts and get a yellow on that third and final attempt that yellow would end the race in the current running order so three attempts at overtime same goal, though. Try to beat everybody else back to the start-finish line. It just always seems right. When I mentioned, you know, it's kind of a tradition week one here, you, you kind of chuckle the nod in your head, right? I mean, it's Daytona racing. We'll probably see it at some of the other plate races as well. Doesn't matter if it's a 500-mile race, if it's tonight, if it's a 200-mile race. These things just always seem to come down to these shootouts. Yeah, I mean, I remember you we were coming to the previous restart, right? You said it's not an overtime yet. Emphasis on the yet. Um, this is uh, what normally happens at Daytona and any of these super speedways, right? Once that first yellow comes out, it's uh, it's always a bit of a chaotic moment here. But you see these two teammates here, these two Spire Motorsports teammates, Malik and Casey Kerwin here. They're they're focused. They're locked in. Look at Casey. Not even a, an emotion on that face. He's ready to go. Malik cracks a bit of a smile finally there, Blake. But this is a big moment, right? I think it's often easy to kind of separate Daytona from all the other races and say, well, it's Daytona. First race of the year. If we win it, we win it. We don't, we don't, right? It's a plate race. But at the end of the day, this race pays just as many points as that regular season finale in Pocono is going to do. It's the start of the shortest segment of the season. There's a $3,000 payout to the segment champion. And of course, that golden ticket to the postseason. So this race just as important, if not more important, than the 13 regular season races that will follow it. Well, again, think of the contrast to two weeks ago. We talked to a lot of drivers during the race. They're all laughing, smiling, having a good time. But the pay window's open. It gets serious now. And you're going to see that from somebody like Malik Ray, who's looking for his first Coke Series win. You're going to see it from somebody like Casey Kerwin, who's looking to win multiple races and is a former Series champion. About three or four drivers up here in the top 11 have never won a Coke Series race before. Daytona is one of their best shots to do it. Let's find out who's going to take it tonight. Buckle up. Here we go. Pace car down and in. Field in the hands of Malik Ray. Green flag in the air. It's Enes Car overtime at Daytona. Inside. Slight advantage. Zelensky, though, right there. Lockstep. Three wide. Back already in P7. That inside lane locked together. Everybody's really working hard, really pushing each other. Zelensky with a big push from White Tinsley on the top lane. But now it's three by three. Junior cars trying to push their way through. You see Caden Honeycutt giving a big shot to Donovan Strauss. 
Outside line's got the speed, though, down the super stretch and into turn number three. 18 is Zelensky, leads that line, followed by Tinsley, followed by Wilson. The Spire cars on the bottom, aided by the 55. Orion Doucette, third in line, are looking for the white flag this time by top side. The place to be, two and a half miles to go in Daytona. We saw that entire top line move to the middle to make it difficult on the bottom cars. The race is official. There's only three lined up on the inside. Many more cars on the outside. But when does this trio break up as they hit the back straightaway for the final time? 20 cars still pushing. 10 cars still pushing. The inside is wide open. Who makes the move on Bobby Zelensky? They both go at once. Zelensky can't make the block. Tinsley gets underneath. Zelensky going to lose the draft. Finally gets picked up by Strauss. But it is an inside breakaway. Three cars strong. Tinsley, Wilson, Ray. Contact in the battle for second. To the apron. Not going to happen in time. And Wyatt Tinsley wins the day two. Toda opener for his first career in NASCAR win. A complete sweep. He won his heat in the clash. He won the clash. And he is one at Daytona. You could see the elation for him. My pick, Wyatt. Great job, buddy. One for one on the year for Wyatt. One for one on the year for Blake in the picks. And it is the quick trip Toyota going to victory lane. What a performance for Wyatt Tinsley. Call him Mr. Daytona. Well, he's going to come off at turn number four. All the drivers pull alongside to wish their congratulations. But the celebration is his. This winning moment is brought to you by Coca-Cola, the official fan refreshment of eNASCAR. Wyatt Tinsley wins the Daytona opener of the 2024 eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. Gets it done in eNASCAR overtime. It is his first career win at iRacing's top oval level. And we wind it back. Let's take a look at your Coca-Cola move of the race. And it all came down to the overtime restart. One lap to go. He is second in line on the outside. Blake, we were all waiting. Who was going to make the move first to try to get underneath Bobby Zelensky? And both he and that Wilson machine behind him waited until they got into turn three. Well, you're going to see where Tinsley is going to make his move. He's assessing right now. Where's that inside line? Where's the momentum with it? He's keeping tabs on Steven Wilson behind him. He's deciding here, am I going to go high? Am I going to go low? He darts to the inside just to block Steven Wilson. I don't know if that's an offensive move where he wanted to pass Zelensky or more so he just wanted to block Steven Wilson. But nevertheless, he's off a of turn four and now the exact same move as he was in the clash. He's the leader trying to block everybody else. The seven car made the move first and it kind of forced into a defensive move with Steven Wilson there. And by the time he was able to shut the door and look back to the lead, Tinsley was home free. And he is your race winner tonight at the Daytona International Speedway. Blake is with him. Two separate times we have competed in 2024, the eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series, and both times we have talked to Wyatt Tinsley. But officially, Wyatt, you are a Coke Series winner. How does it feel? Oh, it feels amazing, man. I I can't, oh my God, I can't thank Steven for pushing me there at the end. Brian Mercurio, oh my God, I'm out of breath completely, but I just, I, I just oh my, I'm, I'm so ecstatic, man. Oh my God, it's amazing. You had, a, you had a couple of moments that race where it was really sketchy. You were almost a part of that yellow that Graham Bolin got turned in where you were having to kind of save your way up front. But the one thing I want to ask you about is the clash a couple of weeks ago. Is there anything you kind of learned or picked up from that? Because you were pretty much in the exact same position heading off a of turn four that you carried into this race tonight. Yeah, I, I, the clash was honestly just a big learning experience um, going into this race. You know, obviously the clash was fixed. And this was open, so it, um, I, I just, I'm out of breath and out of words. And I'm Blake. I'm so glad you picked me, and I'm glad I fulfilled. And <laughs> I, I just, I just can't think. Like today, I got this quick trip bracket, um, one of 50 from Pioneers, and I mean, I had to hang it up for the race. I feel like I might just keep it there for the like. 
I don't know. It might just be my luck and savior, but I can't thank Pioneers, Quick Trip, Price Chopper, everyone at North Force Racing. We are just dominating, and we are just such a good group of people, and I'm so proud of everyone and everything. Should I pick you again next week? Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Wyatt, I know it's been a long time coming for you. You've been on the service for a long time. Go enjoy this win. Uh, happy to see the season that you have and how this sets you up. But, Wyatt, congratulations. You're a Coke Series winner. Let's go playoffs, baby. Let's go. It was great to see a lot of emotion out of Wyatt Tinsley, who becomes another Coke Series winner added to the list and somebody else who was looking to add his name to the winner's list early on our defending champion and Steven Wilson still a great second place effort for you though here tonight uh yeah you know it was really good I was trying to help Wyatt there pretty much the whole last run we're set up teammates so the goal was to try to get one of us uh into victory lane there we did a good job with that one too uh, I want to thank M80 all the partners uh Coca-Cola Logitech everybody who helps with this series um I was blowing up there that whole half last lap. I mean, oil temps, once they reach 284, at any point you can blow up. And going into three, I think I was reaching 300. So I was committed, and whatever happened at that point happened. Well, Steven, you got a new look here with M80, a new team that you're jumping over to. But what's kind of the motivation? You've been at the top of the mountain already before. What's kind of the mindset heading into this year looking to go back to back? Yeah, you know, the mindset's still the same. You know, when you're at the top, you want to stay at the top. Um, it's not something that you want to give up. And uh, this is a good start. You know, Daytona, anything can happen. I mean, we started uh, 34th in this one and made it up to second. So it was just a hectic race. Really good to start a year with some good points. And uh, hopefully we can lead that into a win at some point in the playoffs and also uh, a good segment points. And there's money up for grabs for that. All right, Stephen, congratulations on second tonight. A great start to the season. Up from the 34th starting spot, your defending series champ ends up on the podium in the second position with a brand-new organization joining the eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series in M80. A very solid run for that driver as we move over to the Greer South Carolina native in Malik Ray up front again at the end of a super speedway race, but nevertheless, P3, something you got to be pretty happy about, I think, uh, after race number one. Yeah, man, um, I'm pretty excited about P3 because, uh, you know, I could have ended up in like a crash or something like that. So I'll take P3 and, you know, try to, I guess, just try to build on that. You know, you had a season last year that what was quite remarkable. You were consistent. You were always up at the front at the end of these deals. The one thing you were missing was a win. Does that kind of change your mindset when you're in these positions to have a win that you're kind of willing, as you said immediately today, that you'd be willing to wreck your mom <laughs> to perhaps get a spot in the playoffs? Um, yes and no. Um, I would say no because, like, I know that I'm capable of it of winning a race, I just have to like put all the finishing pieces together. And I would say, I would say yes, because I, because like, I know that if you win, that you're like, you're practically in the playoffs already. So I was trying to win the first race and it just didn't go too well. I got P3, but I, I can't complain. we got a couple of drafting tracks coming up here, Las Vegas, Atlanta, to name a few. How confident do you feel going into those tracks after your performance today? Very confident, extremely confident. Um, always love super speedways and anytime that we can go to them i feel like i have a pretty good shot so all right malik ray another new organization here in the coke series in 2024 spire motorsports well represented by malik ray and p3 as well as casey kerwin who ends up in fourth well, big thanks to those top three drivers for giving us some time to chat post-race. We'll take a look at your Coca-Cola full race results. And what a moment for Wyatt Tinsley in 2023 as a rookie in his first season of competition. Missed out on securing a spot on the grid for this series by one position. Was a tie for 20th and 21st in the points. Goes down to the contender series, competes well, gets a couple of top tens, makes his way back in. And now he has taken the Pioneers to 
the eNASCAR Coca-Cola Series victory lane. If we take a look at those results again, a final margin of victory, five one hundredths of a second over top Steven Wilson and the M80 machine who comes home in second. And it's not the win, but what a day for the Spire Motorsport Chevrolet is three and four from Malik Gray and Casey Kerwin. Bobby Zelensky ended up in the number five spot for him. He had some drivers who led a ton of laps like Michael Cozy Jr. settled for P10. Parker White was strong tonight, too. He comes home in 17th, Blake. Very, very strong. And I think the one thing that's really popping out to me, Evan, when you look at this result sheet is look at the names that we were talking about all night. Those are the names who were fighting for the win at the end of this race. We kind of talked about the differing strategies, whether you wanted to hang in the back, whether you tried uh, to be up front. The majority of this field, the guys that were fighting up front were the guys who settled this and decided this race. There weren't a ton of com comers and goers after the first half of this race. So track position seemed to be the name of the game. And I'm just going to get the first pun out of the way now because you can pull up your stream at the craps table because we're headed to Vegas in two weeks' time. <laughs> second race of the season at Las Vegas Motor Speedway. Bigger story, of course, though, we're headed to an intermediate racetrack. Those make up a bulk of the schedule. And to that point, Ryan, a very different challenge from what we saw here tonight in Daytona. No, absolutely. You saw here tonight a lot of pack racing, a lot of guys working together. Once we get to Vegas, it's all, all on the driver right there. It's all about making sure that you're able to control your race, make sure you have a good handling race car, and make sure that you're there being the first one to cross the line. So what I learned tonight, Blake, is that I'm still learning some of the new faces, new numbers, new teams and whatnot. But I think also what we learned is that Wyatt Tinsley's really good at Daytona. Mr. Daytona swept our iRacing speed weeks, if you will. But beyond that, what can we take away from a plate race that opens up the season as we try to look forward to what's left this year? Well, I think the one thing we look at at Daytona and looking at a lot of the names kind of up here in the finishing order, there, there are a lot of the same drivers that have been strong when we go to a lot of different types of, of tracks, mile and a half, short tracks, some of the road courses we go to. I mean, you think Bobby Zielinski, he's a road course guy, and yet he was leading in turn three to have a shot to win this race. The one thing that's kind of become a theme, I think, not only tonight, but we've seen a trend in the last couple of years is that the good drivers, they're good everywhere in this series. There's almost no more specialty specialists. Guys can go to certain tracks and they do well. Others they don't do well at. It seems like with this next-gen car, there's been a shift in this series where the same drivers are up front at every facility that we go to, uh, not, just, uh, not just one here or there, Ryan. Yeah, I mean, that's the big thing, right? You know, it's knowing who you're working with, knowing your team, and, you know, being able to spend that time working on your race cars, right? I mean, these teams, they all have, you know, affiliate members that they're all working with, all these guys who work all the way through the Contender Series and all, the, all that stuff. So they have teammates to lean ideas off of and work on and build their setup. So we just saw tonight two teammates really work together and find themselves at the front. So uh, that's going to be a very big key as we move forward into the season. And we'll see if that continues. One down, 17 to go. But at least for now, Daytona falls into our rear view mirror. I want to say a big thanks on behalf of everybody behind the scenes at iRacing who makes these broadcasts possible. And of course, on behalf of your broadcast team tonight. For Camille and Allen on Countdown to Green, for Ryan DeVargas, Blake McCandless, and myself, Evan Pasoko. I want to thank you for tuning in and congratulate Wyatt Tinsley, who continued his Daytona dominance with his first career eNASCAR win here tonight at the World Center of Racing. We're back in two weeks' time as the road to $500,000 heads west to the Las Vegas Motor Speedway on Tuesday, February the 27th. That race and every race of the 2024 eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series can be found exclusively here on the iRacing eSports Network and streaming live at eNASCAR.com. Until next time, good night from Daytona. Yeah.